is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. Is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. Hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to another live stream with DCCI Ministries. We do hope that you are all ready for the excitement Christmas brings, which is in two days. Tomorrow is Christmas Eve and Saturday is Christmas Day. So we will be celebrating how the King of Universe steps into the world as a baby. And tonight we will be talking about importance of that. And actually that idea is not strange to the people of the Old Testament, as well as people of the New Testament, alongside of Muslim people, that God steps into the world. Of course, the question is, why God of universe, who created everything and everything in it, will step into the world? The, um, three sites would have 
different views on that. As a Christian, we see from our scripture, our God, relational God, sees and concerns for human beings while human beings are dead in their sin. He comes to give us life. He comes to take us home. And to do that, we do have Jai Apologetics on the line, joining all the way from the other part of the world. And on the left side of the table, sadly, Sister K, she's still alive and she's here. And of course, joyful side on the right <laughs> side, daughter of Christ is here. She is alive and she hasn't killed anyone yet with her cooking skills. So let's go with the basic principles. Gentlemen, first, uh, peace of Christ be with you, beloved of Christ. How are you doing, brother? Peace of Christ be with you, Sister Atun, Sister K, Sister Daughter of Christ, and with all of the viewers. I'm doing well. Thank you. Really excited for the show today and glad to be with you. You've been excited for Christmas for a while now, so days are coming. How are you feeling, brother? Yeah, uh, it's coming closer and closer. Exciting. Uh, I really love the time um, and the, the, what it represents as Christians, um, what it means, what Christmas means to Christians and what we should be focusing on. I'm yeah, really excited about that. Yeah, we do love the theology of um, Christmas because it's all about heart of our God and implication that to humanity. But as a kind of day, I don't think it, it is not my favorite time of the year. I don't think it is favorite time of uh, year for the daughter of Christ. I have no idea about Sister K. We don't discuss those <laughs> issues. <laughs> uh, okay. Brother, thank you very much for joining us today, especially we know we've got time differences and you've got your family, yet you were willing to join us today. Sister Kay, how are you doing? Um, peace of Christ be with you, sister. By God's grace, I'm doing with you. well. Um, do you want to say a couple of more things? I, I, um, <laughs> I think it, I, it's important to celebrate it every day as a follower of Christ. So I just, uh, just would like to just encourage everyone in the chat, um, those that are believers, to um, just remember that every day to celebrate um, our God incarnate. So every day is incarnation feast for us. Um, Daughter of Christ, how are you doing? I'm okay, sister. I'm trying to catch Brother Jai's excitement for Christmas. Uh, I, I I can't, but I, since I, I'm, I'm going to be with you, sister, and uh, Sister K, maybe this uh, Christmas is going to be different from the no. other times. And no, we it... don't do Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do Christmas. We will go to church. We will spend time reading the Bible and pray. And... Pray that it goes or finish very soon. But that's good, sister. I, I mean, I don't like, you know, people using the occasion of Christ's birth to do other things that are ungodly, which is quite common. So that's where the, my negative view of it comes from. But as a believer, I love, obviously, I love that the Lord Jesus stepped into the world. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been saved, sister. So I, I love that. Yeah, we've got a God who not only loves and says that he loves us but he shows his love in action king of universe steps in as a baby and identified as a king not as a prince or anything but he's identified as king jesus so um of course it is not strange to anyone um who read the bible that god certain times stepped into the world as well as engaged with humanity approximately 2000 years ago we don't know exactly the date but approximately 2000 years ago uh eternal son of the father stepped into the world as taking up human nature and today he is still god man in heaven so we will, that's what we will be discussing we will be looking at the uh biblical view and what bible teaches as well as uh, we will be looking at this, looking at some of the Islamic teachings on is God capable to step in and why does he steps into the world if he does. Um, so therefore, I just gently want to encourage those of you who are in the chat, please keep your conversations around this topic. And if you want to get my attention, uh, please put a sign in front of DCCI Ministries. And anything else, please do not abuse and harass the chat. That means please, please do not copy and paste the same message again and again. And um, a couple of weeks ago, we 
put new principles. Please don't use um, kind of language will will make me upset. Any type of language regarding my guests. Um, I don't care about what you call me, but be watchful and be thoughtful um, if you are addressing my guests. Uh, we actually we just put the song Allah is false god in the intention because we received an email from ex-Muslim who expressed this is his favorite song. We just wanted to bring that up so that we don't forget Allah is false God. At the end, we will also put the song, I will praise your name. So we will finish with our glorious gospel. Um, so let's get on with it. Brother Jai, is it, is it will I be correct to say Christmas is the time when the king of universe steps into the world and then invites his people to be his bride. Yes, that is very accurate, sister. I like how you put it. That's exactly what Christmas is about. That's what it should be about. The focus should be on the incarnation. God entering the world, taking on human flesh, taking on a human nature, assuming a human nature. And then, then from there, we proceed, we get the gospel. And that is the glorious news of our Lord and Savior. Uh, and, and that starts with the incarnation, starts with Christmas. And um, do we get to see in the scripture before 2000 years ago, before the biography of Jesus in the Old Testament, that actually Lord steps into the world in different times and different places to engage and communicate with his people is that like brand new idea steps into the world with uh, birth of lord jesus christ or is it um something very common theology throughout old testament yes another great question and the way that i like to frame it is by asking the question similar how to how to you just asked it which is is it foreign is this a foreign concept is this something that the new testament just comes up with do we have any precedent for it at all? God entering into his creation, God taking on a form, God localizing himself, God uh, uh, enjoining whether it's flesh or form. Do we have that? And my answer, yes, we have it all throughout the Old Testament. And it's more common than not, actually. It's more common than not. Uh, and, and, and Lord willing, we're going to get into a lot of examples today where we see God entering into his creation, the becoming tangible, becoming visible, becoming uh, uh, localized, all of these things. So it's not a foreign concept, and we do have it all throughout, witnessed throughout the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Yeah. Thank you very much, brother. Um, beloved, why would um, God step into the world? Why would God come to the world? Uh, sister, we have a very personal, personable God, uh, a God who is not detached from humanity, a God who is not um, uh, far away, who is not cold, uh, a God who wants to relate to us, who comes to us, and um, that is the God that we worship. And so, uh, as we will see today, Sister, uh, through the Old Testament, uh, God steps into the world to speak to um, people, to uh, reassure people, to bless people, and also to direct the history of Israel in certain times, in certain uh, crucial points, uh, ultimately, sister, preparing um, them as a nation for the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the, you know, the main blessing, the main promise from the beginning is to come to for the Lord Jesus Christ to come and save humanity. So that's what we will be talking about today, sister. Thank you, beloved. Um, sister Kay, how does it make you feel that knowing logic of cosmos steps into the world as a baby? It makes me feel overjoyed um, that the creator of the universe would want to come down and to fellowship with man and to... Um, tabernacle with us um it, it shows uh he's most humble 
um, form to come down. So I, I feel overjoyed. That would be the best term for it. Thank you very much. Um, so before we move on to the couple of passages in the Old Testament, um, Brother Jai, let me bring up a question for you. According to some, Christ would, would have been born sometime at the end of the winter. Is that true? Sometime in March? Um, if we go through the chronology in, in Luke, we do get some idea as to what time of year it is. And uh, there's a reason, I mean, there's a reason why, uh, you know, Christmas time is, is uh, depending on the different calendars, it's either early January or late December. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's not just, you know, random guessing. It's there is some indication in the Bible as to when this happened. Uh, as you pointed out, we don't know the exact date, but uh, yeah, we do get glimpses and hints of it. Yeah. So the way it has been um, kind of uh, taught, uh, the, they believe that the prophet would die the day he was conceived in the tummy of mother. So from that, they calculated nine months and then they kind of come up with 25th of um, December, as I as we said, um, we don't know when Lord Jesus Christ born, but for us as a Christian, we are just taking couple of days, couple of days a year to just focus our hearts and our minds on the Incarnation Fest. That's all it is about. Um, okay, so when we turn to Scripture, um, Brother Jai, where do we get to see actually? Um, where do you get to see logic of cosmos, God of universe, steps into the world and have conversation or have engagements or have relationship with his people? Where would you take us? Well, we have it all over the Old Testament, and I'm not exaggerating. It's literally all over. So we're actually having to limit ourselves with examples just for the sake of time and brevity and etc but if we wanted to take the whole the rest of the day we still wouldn't get through all the examples so uh and, and um, just to give people uh, like an idea i'm talking literally at the beginning of genesis once we get to genesis chapter three we have the scripture where they hear god walking in the garden so so um you know this is at the very beginning um genesis chapter three Verse eight. Uh, so, but let's let's just go into some specific examples, though. So, we can we can uh, share together. So, one passage in particular that speaks to God becoming visible, God being seen or becoming uh, manifest or taking on a form, becoming tangible, is His vision to. Abraham, before he was Abraham, he was Abram. And if we go to Genesis chapter 15, the very beginning verses, and this is going to strike a chord with all of the Christians and everyone who's familiar with John chapter 1, that Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right away, you're going to notice in Genesis 15 verse 1, after these things, I'm reading from the New King James Version, after these things, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, just want to pause there. Why does it say vision? So a lot of people, they have this idea that a vision means that this is not something that takes place in physical time and space. This is not actually something that takes place before your eyes, but it's, it's like a dream or something like that. That's actually not how the Bible uses the word vision. And and if you check how God is communicating with Abraham, you'll see that this is the time when Abraham actually beholds God. He actually sees God. He sees the word of God. And so it's saying, in, saying, in contrast to just hearing his voice, he's now actually seeing a vision. There's now actually a visual to this. So it's not just hearing a voice. So I'm going to continue reading. So this is what the word of the Lord the word of Yahweh says to Abram, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, 
Lord God, what will you give me, seeing as I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. The word of the Lord, again, verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body shall be your heir. Now check out this verse, verse 5. Then he brought him outside. Who brought him outside? It says in verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him. And then in verse 5, it says, Then he brought him outside and said to him, Look now towards the heaven and count the stars, if you're able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. Now, what's key to point out here is, as I mentioned, vision is saying that this is something going on with uh, th this is visible so abraham is actually seeing something there's a vision here he's not just hearing something he's actually seeing something and then it goes on to say that the word of the lord the word of the lord came to him and then he brought him outside he brought him outside so again you get the, you get the imagery that this is something tangible this is something visible it's right in front of him he brought him outside they went outside together Okay, so this is one of the first examples we'll be looking at today where we see very clearly the word of the Lord appearing visibly before Abraham, then Abram. And this is one of those examples. Yeah. Um, shall we continue with verse 6 and 7? Yeah, yeah. Feel free to add any points yeah. that you want to. You yeah, want so, add more, um, go ahead. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, the word of Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur. So, word of God is speaking, word of God is visible, word, word of God is tan um, tangible. Taking Abraham outside, having discussion and identifying himself as I am the Lord. And of course, that will take us back to the beginning of John chapter 1, where the word of God comes and then makes his dwelling among us. Um, yes. And we also get the idea in Genesis, uh, sorry, in, in uh, John chapter 8, starting in verse 56, in John chapter 8, we see... Um, Jesus is saying to the to the to the Pharisees to the Jews that your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he was and he saw it and was glad and this is the famous uh, I am statement the Jews said to him you're not yet 50 years old yet have you and you have seen Abraham Jesus said to them most surely I say to you before Abraham was I am so Jesus is saying that Abraham rejoiced to see his day and saw it and was glad and what we just read what we just read was that the word, so Jesus, the word of God, the word of God is saying that Abraham saw his day and was glad. The word of God just said that. Jesus, the word of God just said that. And in Genesis 15, the word of God visibly appears to Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. So you see a lot of connections here um, uh, with, you know, throughout, throughout uh, the New Testament. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, brother. So we looked at Genesis chapter 15, where we say, where we say Abraham is not um, foreign to idea that God steps into the world and have conversation with his people. Abraham experienced when the word of God steps into the world and have conversation with him. So that also shows us word of God is not a force or anything. Word of God is person. Um, beloved, would you like to add anything? I think it's wonderful. Uh, I love studying the Word of God. It's also congruent and it's, um, it all affirms each other. Uh, I like the link with John 8. Uh, exactly. Uh, Abraham did see the Word of God. He did see uh, Jesus Christ. And I also liked um, when you continue to verse uh, 7, 
in, uh, in Genesis 15 where the word of God identifies himself as the Lord who brought um, brought him out of um, uh. the Ur uh, uh, of Chaldeans. <laughs> I can't say that word very well. So that is God. That is, you know, there's no, um, there's no doubt here who the speaker is. Amen. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, Abraham with his wife and also uh, Hagar um, have kind of one-to-one -one engagement with God of universe. Um, so we, like, if you read uh, Genesis 15, 16 to until end of 22, you get to see how much God is involved in their life and how he communicates and practice. Even God steps in and then destroys Sodom and Gomorrah uh, because the sins they commit. So it's all like five, six chapters together um, how Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnation is engaging with his people. Um, Sister Kay, um, yes. what, do you want to add anything on Genesis chapter 15, how the word of God is engaging with his people in this occasion with Abraham? Um, I think it's important to notice that um, he makes a promise um, and that he's a promise keeper to Abraham. He's not a deceiver, um, and um, that he he reminds him that he took him out of that he's delivering him and taking him out of Ur of the Chaldee, Chaldees, um, Chaldeans. Even uh, I can Chal pronounce that word too <laughs> because I use that in the British too. <laughs> anyway, focus. <laughs> but um, I, I just it's it's showing that he's not only is he able to keep his promise. To Abraham as he stands, but in the future, so he's he he sees past what Abraham can see. So. Yeah, so we've got God who steps into the world, engages with His people, give His people promises, and shows that He's faithful one who keeps His promises. Uh, thank you very much for bringing that to our attention, Brother Jai, and also. We saw how the New Testament takes us back to the time of um, Abraham, approximately 2,000 years um, before time of Jesus, um, and then express how Lord Jesus Christ steps into the world. Um, beloved, have you got um, anything in the Old Testament that you see um, God steps in and engages with his people? Yes, uh, I chose Genesis 32, sister, uh, verses 22 to 32, and I'm reading the ESV. Uh, Genesis? Genesis 32, verses 22 to 32. It's amazing, like, um, as we turn to the different translations, we get to see how they complement one another in a sense. The reason I read the ESV is because I understand it and I hear that it's a literal translation, so I like that. Um, so the background, sister, until you find it, is um, Jacob um, had actually was going through a very rough time. So he'd separated finally from Laban, who was a worldly man, and he was also afraid of meeting his brother Esau, um, and he was so distressed about it because... Uh, he had deceived his brother Esau by stealing his birthright, by deception, the firstborn blessing um, from Isaac. And um, Esau had sworn to kill Jacob, and Rebekah had, had helped Jacob, and she had told him to go away until his brother forgets what he has done. And so um, he, she said that she would send for him, when that happens, but she hadn't sent for him, so he knew that brother, his brother Esau was coming, and uh, he was afraid, and God had promised that he would protect him, though, in um, the previous chapter, 31, uh, when he said to him, return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I'll be with you. So I'm going to read it, sister. So um, it says, verse 22, the same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. So, um, and Jacob was left alone. So he was alone. His family were not with him. His, none of the, his possessions were with him. And that's when he has an, an encounter with the, um, with the angel of the Lord. 
um, verse 25, um, sorry, verse 24 still, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Uh, this is a very important verse, sister, for um, Muslims and others who say, you know, uh, Jacob wrestled with God and, you know, he, he won. This is to show, sister, that um, who was the more powerful person in the encounter. Um, and also we know that in Hosea 12, which mentions this incident, he, he actually asked for God's blessing with weeping. He was, he was weeping. He was, he was the weaker one. He was the one who was seeking this, this man. Um, and then verse 26, he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So again, we see who has the power here. It's the man who has the power to bless him. And actually Jacob was just clinging to him. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means the face of God, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose up upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel did, do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. So he assisted this so much in um, Jacob's encounter. So first of all, we see that this is God. The, the angel of the Lord is God because in verse 30, Jacob says, I have seen God face to face. And um, we also see um, that even though he got God or the, the man in the interaction had supernatural powers to end the fight, to, to basically prevail over Jacob, he let Jacob prevail. And um, this, is, this, this, this sister is, um, and he changes his name from, Jacob, which is associated with deception and um, cheating, to Israel, which is uh, Israel comes from the Hebrew word meaning to fight with God. And that is what happens to us when we encounter the, um, the blessed descendant, the blessed descendant of Jacob, the Lord Jesus Christ. The, he changes us with his blessing. And that's what I've learned from this passage. Um, Sister, and also it's very interesting to me that he says in verse, um, Jacob asks him, he, he asks him in verse 29, what is, wh what is your name? Please tell me your name. And he says, why is that? Why is it that you ask my name? And I see that in um, Judges 13, when uh, the angel of the Lord uh, speaks to um, um I can't remember his name. Uh, Manoah, I think his name is, um, ahead of the birth of uh, Samson. And they also, uh, he also asks him, what is your name? And he says, why do you ask my name? For, for, is, uh, for seeing it is wonderful. That's in Hosea, tw uh, in Judges uh, 13. And obviously we know um, one of the names of the Lord is Wonderful Counselor. That's in Isaiah 9, 6. Mighty God, the, the, the child that is uh, born to us, the son that is given to us, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the man that uh, Jacob was wrestling with um, in Genesis 32. Amen. Okay, thank you very much, sister. Um, Brother Joy, uh, would you like to add anything? I mean, that was so well put. I don't know what else I could add to that, but... I will highlight some points that the sister made that that as she stated the very name Israel itself the very name Israel itself attests to the topic that we're talking about so we're asking the question today we're asking if God can become tangible if God can become visible if God can 
reveal himself to the human eye, if God can become localized. And the very name Israel itself attests to the fact that that's the case. Because as the sister read in verse 28, and he said to him, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. And then it goes on. What's the reason why? Why is your name called Israel? Because you have, you know, some translation will render it differently, but it essentially means to, to struggle or to uh, some kind of, there, there's some sort of tension there between God and between men. So the very name Israel itself is attesting to the fact that God does manifest himself in visible ways to people. And if people want to say like this, maybe let's say like, oh, this is a vision or something like that. One way to easily counter that is because look what happened to Jacob's hip. His hip wouldn't have been injured if this was just a mere vision. So we know that there wasn't, this was, sorry, when I say vision, I'm, I'm using it in the, in the way people normally use it in, in a way to try to dismiss these kind of topics when they say, oh, these are just visions, not in the way that uh, the Bible uses the term, but more in like a colloquial sense that people will try to dismiss these things. Um, this is not just uh, some kind of uh, something that, that's happening in the mind or something like that or in the mind's eye, but this is something that's happening physically in real, um, real space and real time. Why? Because Jacob's hip, look at Jacob's hip. There was actually, he actually had an injury. So this is something that really happened. Uh, the sister pointed out that first, first um, he's identified as a man and then later identified as God, Elohim. And then we go to Hosea and we see again, defi de de um, uh, defined as God, defined as the angel, which we know the angel of the Lord is not a creature in the Old Testament, the, the angel of the Lord. And then later on in Hosea, it says that this is, it uses the name Yahweh. So, so we know for sure who Jacob was struggling with, who uh, Jacob was wrestling with. And yeah, great, great summary. Yeah, and also as, so it, also in um, 1 Kings, it is identified as the word of Lord. So, angel of the Lord, and the word of Lord, and Lord. It's all like such a blessing, such a blessing. Um, thank you, sister, for that passage. Um, sister K, um, anything you would like to add? Um, I think it's, um, well, first and foremost, you put it very, very well, uh, daughter. Um, I think to... Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, to to, it's just funny how he he changed his name, and um, from deceiver, to struggles with God. Um, but also, um, I would just say the, the vision. I, I thank you, uh, Jai, for the clarity because you also, uh, I've heard people say that that was like a, a hallucination. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Um, also what we have also in other uh, parts of the, the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so what we have is so far, um, God appears, God appears in form of man. Uh, God of universe humbles himself and have wrestling with man. And he's so powerful with his touch, he breaks the hip of man. And scripture identifies the angel of the law, uh, identifies the one who Jacob engaged as the angel of the Lord, as well as, as the word of God. And Jacob identifies him as Yahweh. So uh, it's amazing. So what we see again, something unique with our God. God steps in. This is the second occasion we saw. God steps in and engages with his people. God enters into his creation. Um, beloved of Christ, Jai, why, do, why would God engage with Abraham and with Jacob? What is it so special with them? It's more to what, what our sister, daughter of Christ, had mentioned earlier. It's more the God that we serve, the God that we have. It's a very personal God. 
he's not a god like in jeremiah like he's not so far away he's not no but he he's he's close he's he's up near and personal and he takes on forms and takes on visibility and takes on uh, uh, flesh and, and, and appears in, in many different ways throughout uh, throughout his word. So the reason why is just because that's God's nature, God's God's heart. If we go to Exodus 25 verse 8, in Exodus 25 verse 8, we actually have God's heart, God's desire for uh, what he wants to do with his people. And he says, he says, have them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This is the heart of God, Emmanuel, God with us. This is God's heart to be with his people, to, to dwell with his people. And this is just the beautiful God that we serve. And and there's, there's just so much to say. There's so much beauty and so much glory in what he does. I just want to, before I... um. Uh, uh, finish. I just want to add one one more point, which is to say that Jesus, um, when uh, speaking to his disciples in one occasion, he asked the question about like who's the greatest, and he kind of gets into this concept of like servant leadership, uh, uh, like like servant leadership, like the greatest among us is the servant, and he says like who's who's greater, is it is it the one at the table or is it the one who serves the table? And he says, isn't it the one who's, who's at the table? But then he says here, but I am among you as someone who serves. So, so the, the greatest one is the one who serves. That's the beauty. That's the heart of our God. It's, it's magnificent. It's loving. It's beautiful. And, and that's the heart of our God. He humbles himself. He steps in to serve his people. He humbles himself. He steps into the, this broken world. Why? Because he wants to dwell with them. He wants people to dwell with him. Uh, Matthew expresses heart of our God is humble and lowly. Uniqueness of our God. Uniqueness of our God. He doesn't let us go. He wants to pursue us. He wants to build. Uh, he wants to bring us home. Um, anyone wants to add anything? Um, Thought of Christ. We got Dawa Gang saying Isaiah 9 6 is about Hezekiah. Oh, bless him, bless his heart. Shall we read it, sister? Because I know they follow an illiterate prophet. Uh, yeah. Yes, let's turn let's Isaiah. Maybe just um, maybe just remind just remind people why Isaiah 9 was brought up in the first place. You were, you were speaking about Judges 13 and the angel there, the angel of the Lord was asked his name. And one of the names that we see in Isaiah 9 is is wonderful Pele. yeah so this is the name that was given um in judges 13 so just to kind of remind people why that was brought up so um can can i just get a little bit more clarification on uh how come a uh, part of islamic dawah gangs come to the conclusion this is about hezekiah he says he was he was a contemporary a contemporary of isaiah yeah okay let, so, so the argument uh, no, go ahead, sister, daughter. If you want to read it, go ahead. I just want to read it just to show that if you don't read like your prophet, you end up looking silly. 9-6, let's see if it's about Hezekiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be up upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Is Hezekiah Mighty God? Everlasting Father. Is Hezekiah Everlasting Father? Prince of Peace. So uh, if you just read it, you, then you wouldn't. And keep reading, sister. Yeah. Let's see if it applies to Hezekiah okay. or not. Let's see okay. if this applies. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Wow, Hezekiah is amazing. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Amen. of hosts will do this. Amen. So we see, and this is not just the, the Dawah gangs. What their Dawah gangs are doing here is they're parroting the Jewish counter missionaries and they're trying to attribute. Okay, so here's, here's the thing with the counter missionaries. This is like a little insight when dealing with them. 
everything that we say in the Old Testament, almost everything that we say in the Old Testament is a prophecy of Jesus and his first coming. They say that was historical. So they'll say this is about Hezekiah. Some They don't all agree it's about Hezekiah. Some will say Hezekiah, some will say others. Um, and then everything that we say for his second coming, they agree this is future. This is what the Messiah will do. So everything that we say is prophesied in the Old Testament of the second coming. The counter missionaries today will tell us, yes, these are messianic things you think the Messiah will do. But everything we say happened in the first coming, they'll say, oh, no, these are all historic. These happened in the past. So uh, you'll see that there's a lot of, um, uh, no, obviously, this is just counter missionaries today. These are modern counter missionaries today. And when I say counter missionary, for those not familiar with that terminology, um, the there are certain rabbis and certain Jews who set themselves up as countering um, missionaries. So they call themselves counter missionaries. And what they do is they exist to, their, their highest goal is to kind of uh, speak to Christians who have Jewish ethnic descent. So if you're a Christian and you're ethnically Jewish, you're their target. Um, and then secondary, it's, you know, uh, Gentile Christians, they'll, they'll talk to Gentile Christians as well. But their primary goal is to take, um, take Jews away from Jesus. And so, so what their focus is, is to say things like, you know, Hezekiah is the, you know, the, the referent of Isaiah 9. Um, it's not the case, though. If you start, so, so if you look at the overall picture and what's happening in Isaiah, Starting in chapter 7 to chapter 11, you'll see this is an overall big, big, big picture messianic uh, messianic vision from chapter 7 to 11. And so these prophecies that were not, these prophecies that were not brought to pass in the immediate horizon of Isaiah's time, we see actually they were fulfilled in the Messiah. And as, as Dart of Christ rightly pointed out, these titles belong to God and to God alone to call someone Everlasting Father, the Hebrew Aviad, means the person who fathered eternity, the one who created eternity, is the father of eternity. Not to confuse him with God the Father in relationship to the Trinity, but to be the father of something is to be the in this context is to be the creator of it. So father of eternity, the one who creates eternity. Hezekiah surely did not create eternity. Al Gibor, mighty God. Hezekiah is not mighty God. Um uh, all these titles in one way or another. Are, are divine um, in nature. So they point to the Messiah, who is God incarnate, not to, uh, not to any other earthly kings that are just merely, merely kings, merely humans. Yeah, and also um, I am very much aware that some of the people are much better than their prophet. They can read and write in these occasions. If they are very much lazy, they can't read from Isaiah 7 to 11. You can simply start end of chapter 8, which gives you also kind of part of context, not fully, but like gives you little bit um, details. It expresses that this child is stepping into the world when it is all in full darkness. But 8.22, then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And there will be thirst until utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebedun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor, where? He will honor, let me put it on the screen so those people who are struggling, honor, he will honor a uh, Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light mm -hmm. on those living in the land of shadow of death. A light has dawned. And then it goes on how people are going to call him. And we already went through and we go through that passage almost um, last four weeks of <laughs> <laughs> December every Sunday at the church as well as it is our daily reading. So please, please, Dawah gangs and those who hate Lord Jesus Christ come up with better responses. So you have to mm -hmm. deal, you have to deal to us. A child is born and son is given. Not son is born to us. Child is born and son is given. Government will be sh um, on his shoulders 
and his kingdom will be forever. And his name is God. Yeah, <laughs> so my how God, can it be like, God. So how can it be yeah. Hezekiah? It's yeah. like forevermore. Wow. It's, it's like if we, we come, uh, it, it, it makes sense to us because people come from the background where people don't practice that much their brains. Um, especially if people are strongly encouraged to not read and study their scripture because that will cause them to ask questions. Therefore, they will treat the people of the scripture of the people of the book in the same way. But don't do that. That's just like really bad, really, really bad. It's the same demonic spirits, sister, that uh, is in these dawah gangs that want to twist scripture, which is what the devil wants to do. And also mm -hmm. the um, anti-missionaries, which Brother Jai talked about. It's the same spirit. Yes. It's the same spirit that wants to deny the simple words that are coming out of the passage saying, this is God. Yes. How can it be a human being? Sorry, and, God. and I mean, to add what you, um, I was caught off guard yes, earlier. I'm sorry. Um, to add um, your scripture, uh, daughter, it says, so Jacob called the name of the place, Penel, saying, um, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. And it reminded me of John chapter one. Uh, of where um, John is saying like he they were able to like see the living word and, like in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and he, they were able to actually it dwelt among us and so this is just something that you see frequently throughout scripture that our God is willing to come down and to be with us as human beings whereas um, yes I think the word willing, um, willingly is very important. Logic of cosmos, the word of God, the son of God, was under zero obligation. Yet he chose to step in, not as a warrior, but he chose to step in as a baby king. Vulnerable baby. He didn't turn up into rich household into the palaces, but he turned up in major. So that's already screams out heart of our God. That's what make Christian faith unique. Um, okay, anyone wants to add anything on this or did anyone yeah. get, got any attention from the, any questions from the chat? Um, chat is a little bit yeah. distanced to me today. Yeah, yeah, um, I just want to add some more to this. So, so one of the reasons why the Jews considered Hezekiah as the referent to this is because there's a discussion in the Talmud that Hezekiah should have been the Messiah. There's a discussion about that. Obviously, they conclude he wasn't, but there's a reason why they chose him as the referent to this passage. And then if you go to the ancient Jewish Targum, which is a translation into Aramaic, the way that it renders this passage is it says it says it very similar to how we just read it now but it adds in this part because the targum was a, it's a translation paraphrase translation and also gives their interpretation so you're not just getting a pure translation you're getting their interpretation as well and one of the things that they, that they how how they render this verse is they say one of the names is the messiah of peace messiah of peace Mashiach of Islam, which means the Messiah of peace, meaning they interpret it to be messianic. So, so, the, the, so again, if if you see, if you see in, in as as Isaiah chapter seven, you'll see that the prophecy of the virgin birth, you'll see that happening. You keep going on to chapter eleven, you're going to see this big messianic vision throughout chapter seven to eleven, like I mentioned uh, previously, but. But there's a reason why, because even even the ancient Jewish uh, uh, translators and interpreters rendered and understood this to be messianic. Now, what's interesting, I think Sister K was, I believe it was Sister K. Someone mentioned they, they mentioned this part that uh, that a son is given to us. A son is given to us, and and it's been point. This has been often pointed out, but in the Hebrew, it says ki yelid yulid lenu. And ki yalid yulid lenu. Now, daughter of Christ, who speaks Arabic, probably sees a cognate there in Arabic, which is in the Quran, in chapter uh, uh, Al-Ikhlas, it says... 112. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so the Quran says God does not do this. The Bible 
thousands of years before it it saying that. God does do this. Mm -hmm. So that's a really uh, important point of contrast that in prophecy, it's saying, yes, this child is going to be given. This, this child is going to be born. He is going to be born to us. And the Quran is saying that God does not do this. He does not, you know, give birth and, and things like this. Uh, or he doesn't, he doesn't beget or he does, whatever. So, so that's, that, that's a big point of contrast as well. Yeah. Um, I guess just going back to my question, which was, we so far we just looked at only two characters. Uh, we've got many more characters where word of God steps in and then engages with his people. So we saw how the word of God comes and then engages with Abraham and with Jacob. My question was, what what is unique with them that Lord chooses to speak with them, Lord chooses to engage with them, Lord chooses to communicate with them, even have a wrestling uh, match with them? I guess the answer we are saying it, it is nothing about them, but it is about heart of our God. Our God is willing to step in and engage Amen. with his people. Nothing unique with those individuals, but uniqueness of our God, uniqueness of our God. His relational God, he is there to make himself known. As we looked at in Exodus 25, he wants to dwell with his people. Um, Anyone wants to add anything so far, or does anything got any um, our attention in the chat? Actually, there is something um, addressed to uh, Jai. Um, so this is yeah. Um, so I mean, wait. what I said earlier refutes this, right? I mentioned the Targum. The Targum is a non-Christian source, and the Targum sees that this is messianic. So I'm not sure exactly what point um, he's responding to when he says this. But we can we can parallel this. We, we can say, look, if you're saying that this is not messianic in nature, then explain to us how the Targums, how the Targums understood this to be messianic, translating, you know, a little t before the time of the incarnation and contemporary to Jesus, this the kind of thing for the Targums. Um, but specifically the one for, for Isaiah, we have it that the Jews writing this are writing it and, and they're translating it and understanding it to be messianic. So no, it's not reading New Testament theology into the Old Testament. It's actually the opposite. It, you see that you see that you see how it's so and so it, such harmony. You, and and if, and so if you're and then if you're saying you know the idea of God manifesting Himself or God becoming visible or tangible, if you're saying that we're reading that into the Old Testament, I mean we're just simply reading the passages for what they say. Like we read we read them we read them word for word. It's very clear what they're saying. We're not reading into the text. We're reading the text, and that's the obvious conclusion. Words have meaning, meanings, and uh, and so we're just assuming that the text means what it says, right? And that's a safe assumption until, you know, we get to the Quran where Muslims say that we can't actually trust what it says. Yeah, so um, same gentleman expresses um, something. All I am going to say is it's clearly you left your brain at home. Or, or someone paid you to be stupid. So, sorry, nothing personal in this occasion, but just you left your ears and your brains at home in this occasion. Um, okay, shall we um, continue? Sister K, you were planning to make a point which I cut you off intentionally. Now, your no, turn you, to make your case. Um, no, you actually, uh, you actually picked up where I was going to go with it, so you're fine. Because I'm so good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, uh, I just want to say that last gentleman is a hypocrite because if he agrees with the Jewish Targum that says Hezekiah is the, is the Messiah, the Messiah, then he's not a Muslim because Muslims know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Messiah. So what, you got two options. Either you go with the Jewish people, the Targum, who said Hezekiah is the Messiah, then uh, welcome to apostasy, or... You agree with us that this is about the Messiah. You agree with them that this is about the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. In which case, it says that He is God. So where are you gonna go? So you can't you can't share bed with two people. Yep. I know in in Islam yeah. you can do lots of things, but <laughs> but yeah. I just want to clarify. In basic principles, you've got to choose Jewish scripture or you've got to choose your scripture. And both which of them actually are Quran comes to co supposed to confirm the Jewish scripture or Jewish thoughts in this occasion. Do you want to choose the Jewish thoughts and then go to bed with them and then deny 
Quran where Jesus is identified as the Messiah or you want to choose your prophet and go to bed with your prophet and then identify Jesus as the Messiah and then go against the thoughts of some Jews by the way just make it clarify because disciples of Lord Jesus Christ were Jews and early Christians were Jews um yeah just to be clear um so for the tar for the for the targum the targum is saying that this is about the messiah but it's not identifying the messiah in the talmud though it's the talmud that has this discussion there's a debate in the talmud so, so there's a, the, a whole whole discussion about this that hezekiah should have rightly been the messiah and then there's a whole debate about that they end up concluding that he's not obviously but uh, but you, that's why they apply some of these passages to him because they're supposed to be messianic in nature so any Muslim who, who who's agreeing, daughter's point it stands perfectly uh, as she said it. Any Muslim who's agreeing with the Jews that these are in fact messianic, well then you have to apply these titles to the Messiah. So are you okay with calling the Messiah mighty God? Are you okay with calling him the creator of eternity? Are you okay with calling him those things? Yeah, they have to side with the Jewish sources because they... They, they, because the Jewish sources deny that it's Christ. But if they do that, then they think Hezekiah is the Christ, which is against Islam. So it's like a checkmate situation where um, Islam puts you in, where wherever you go, Islam is a false prophet. You go with the Jews, it's a false prophet. You go with... <laughs> false religion. For, um, sorry, false religion. And Muhammad is a false prophet. Sorry. So... Um, yeah. It's like, it's like I, the I Islamic guess... dilemma, like Catch-22. Yes, yeah, catch yeah. <laughs> I guess the bottom line is this. Uh, very soon we will also looking at the Islamic sources and then we will see how in Islamic sources Allah also steps into the world. But the basic question so far what we have is here. Exodus 25 verse 8. Okay, God of universe, mighty God, is stepping into the world for his people without any obligation, yet he's choosing to step into the world to be with his people. He wants to dwell with his people. The question is, are you willing to make a room in your heart for Almighty God? That's a very simple question. I think that's how we will kind of um, come back to again, because why God steps in to engage with his people? Because he wants to dwell with his people. Um, sis Sister Kay, you were going to make a point. Um, I mean, just what you were just saying, it, it reminded me of, it reminded me of um, Revelation 21. Like, and this is echoed throughout scripture um, that the Lord will um, tabernacle and dwell with his people again and again. You keep hearing this and it's, and you see it that God, like you said, under no obligation comes in fellowships with man. So it just, it's a reoccurring theme in Genesis 18 and one, um, where it says, let me, I'm sorry, let me get that really quick for you. Um, and it says, and the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre and sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. So this is just another, you know, the Lord coming and um, that's as, again in the occasion of Abraham and the, in the occasion of Abraham. Yep. And this is, I mean, if they try to deny this, he actually, Abraham goes and prepares food for the Lord. So, yeah. Like, yeah. Again, not, not like uh, a hallucination, not like anything like that. Like there, there's food, there's dust, all these little details that wouldn't make any sense if this was, you know, something that wasn't taking place in real time space. Um, so, and, 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 you know, there's, there's, all, there's a lot to say about that, but it's just all throughout the Old Testament, we see time and time and time and time again, that we see God appearing, God appearing, God appearing, God appearing. So it's, it's like the, the incarnation, as we see it happening, like this is something, so, so maybe we should have defined these terms earlier on, but a theophany is when God appears. So what we're discussing now, these are the, the technical term or the theological term is called a theophany. Theophany means God appears or God appearing. That's different than the incarnation. The incarnation was a one-time event where God incarnate, he took on flesh as in he, he assumed, he took on a human nature. So 
so uh, so so we have all throughout the old testament god appearing god appearing god appearing and so it's no surprise that for the ultimate act of redemption the ultimate uh, when i say act i don't mean it in like a like a play sense but i mean like it, this is what's happening the ultimate thing to redeem the world the ultimate thing of salvation that is god taking on human flesh it's no surprise that god's going to do the most important event in human history in the history of <laughs> Like imagine anyone else doing that than God Himself. The most important thing. This is God Himself doing it. So, yeah. Um, this is not something new. This is not something foreign. This is something thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly. You could say Jewish. You could say Old Testament rooted. You could say rooted in the Bible. Yeah. So in the Old Testament, God appears with the birth of King Jesus. Uh, Lord become, takes up human nature, becomes God-man forever. Um, okay, so, um, Sister Kay. Yes. Um, have you got anywhere in the scripture, um, let's go back to kind of our main point, where you see God um, appears in form and engages with his people? Yes, I have um, Exodus 14. Um, verses 18 through 31. Um, okay, give me a second. I'll get that on the screen. I apologize. I thought I was sharing screen. Sorry. Let's see. Yep. Exodus 14. Mm -hmm. Verses 18 through 31. And yes, sister. Okay. When um, are you ready? Okay. I'll read it from the ESV. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And I'm sorry, in the context of delivering the children of Israel from Egypt and Pharaoh is behind them. Okay. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness. And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and of, the, of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the fort Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course. When the morning appeared, and, and as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into, this, into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters being a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. 
So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Okay, so you just read the chapter. Can you just unpack for us, sister? Um, yes, as you um, go into verses 19, you see the pillar. Um, the I'm sorry, you say the angel of the Lord who was going before them. Um, and he um, was a pillar of cloud and, and he was a fire, a light by night. Um, and he stood behind them as Pharaoh was coming to pursue them. Um, so God is not only he, I mean, as in John 8 and 12, that he's the light of the world. So it, it's a, a common thing that you see God as a protector and a deliverer throughout the, um, and a redeemer as mentioned in Isaiah 9 and 6, um, throughout the scripture. So. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, beloved of Christ Joy, do you want to add anything on um, on this passage? Yeah, absolutely. This is just really beautiful. Thank you, sister, for reading that and explaining. First uh, Corinthians chapter ten, the beginning of the chapter reads: Moreover, brother, and I do not want you to be unaware that our all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the spiritual food and all ate, all excuse me, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So we get a specific identification when we're talking about these, these uh, when we're talking about the Exodus and what was going on. Um, it's very, very, very clear that not only, as the sister points out, not only is this another example where God is so personally interacting, he's right there with them. You know, he's traveling with them. He's moving with them, the, the cloud, the, the fire, all of this. And then we find out that this rock, the rock that followed them is Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. So, amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, beloved, do you want to add anything? I think it's so beautiful um, how Brother Jai said it and how Sister Kay said it. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he appears in the Old Testament to do everything that God does, protect. Um, he uh, warns Abraham of the uh, coming punishment to Lot. He uh, wrestles with Jacob. Um, in, in, um, he wrestles with Jacob when he was alone and, and scared. Uh, he uh, eats food with Abraham. He, uh, and now he is protecting his people as they are going uh, crossing the Red Sea. Uh, it's just beautiful. And I know Sister Kay wants to add something. I know. She's... <laughs> <laughs> no, you just reminded me of something. Um, you, daughter, as well as Brother Jai. Um, it's just uh, in a couple chapters over that he's the rock and that he's Exodus 16 4. You know, um, he provides water. And that Jesus is the living water. And that if you drink of him, you'll never thirst. You know, and, and this is a, a, a common theme that you're seeing, this parallel in the Old Testament and New Testament. This also shows the authority of the scripture. This is not just some copy-paste book that's borrowed from different religions. This is the authoritative word of God. So, Amen. I want to ask you, uh, you two sisters and brothers, something. Why do people have such a hard time accepting that God it can in, step into creation and interact with his people in this way so close and they think that he can't wouldn't do that because they it's stand up to him. Sorry? It's be, um so sorry question is um why would uh, people are struggling to understand God would step into the world? Um I I think a lot of them they stand as bouncers to tell God what he can and cannot do. And if you can tell your God what he can and cannot do, is he your God or are you his God? Okay, Brother Joy, why yeah, do people I, I was, struggle? Yeah, um, they struggle because they are more committed to things that they believe to be true than to the word of God itself. 
So as we're going to get into Lord willing, we'll show even from the Quran, which we're going to see there's a world of difference between reading the Bible and the life that the Bible brings and the love and the joy and the, the God's amazing, you know, Jesus said, for my words are spirit and they, for they give, for the, um, uh, John chapter 6, verse 67, um, or 68, sorry. Is it 67 or 68? Uh, I always get like one verse off. Uh, so right. my words are spirit and, and they give life. And they give life. So we're going to see a world of difference between, and a contrast between while well, we read the Bible and the Bible is giving life to when we get to the Quran. But we're going to show, <clears throat> Lord willing, we're going to show that even a witness in the Quran is that God or their conception of God, their Allah, can actually appear. And this is attested to in Islam um, through through the Quran, through their sources like Hadith literature, that, that their God can actually appear. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I had to clear my throat. Um, so their God can actually appear. And so we're going to see that they're more committed to creeds. They're more committed to doctrines than they are to what they believe to be the word of God. And in the case of Jewish people who, who deny this, which there are um, some, uh, uh, you know, modern Jews who will deny this. In, in their case, they're more committed to the same thing. They're more committed to creeds and what can't be the case than what the word of God actually says. I'll give you an example. So one of the um, primary figures in Judaism who gives Jewish law and understanding of what Jewish law is, his name is Moshe ben Maimon, Maimonides, the Rambam. You might hear him by any of those three names. And what he says in his 13 principles of the Jewish faith, one of his principles is that God doesn't have a body. And what he means by that is that God is completely um, uh, distant from his creation. He's so far away. He's so absent. He's so, you know, all this, all this. He's, he can't interact with the, his creation. So there, so that's a principle of their faith. So because that's a principle of the Jewish faith, for the, for the Jew I'm speaking, for, because it's a principle for their faith to not believe this, whenever the Bible says that, they can't believe what the Bible says. They have to go by what the rabbis say, what Maimonides said. So this is um, this is something, unfortunately, that if they just read the read the Bible for itself and, and prayed out to God and asked God to God, uh, lean not on your understanding, <laughs> type you know in Proverbs three, uh, lean not on your understanding type of thing. If they were to do that, um, they and they were to they were to ask God to speak to them through His Word and show them the truth, no matter the price, no matter the cost, no matter the consequence then they would all come to this conclusion because it's so clear. It's, it's so crystal, it's crystal clear. It's very like, who can get around this text? So, so the reason why they deny this is because they're, they're convicted by, or they're, 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 um, they're married to these unbiblical concepts that they can't denounce or can't deny. So for the case of the Muslims, they are committed to certain creeds that even if it contradicts the Quran, they won't accept what the Quran says. For the Jews, for the most part, they're Orthodox Jews. They're committed to creeds that even if it contradicts the word of God, um, what they believe, you know, in the Old Testament, the word of God, then they will go with what the rabbis say over what the clear, plain meaning of the Bible says. Sorry for the long answer, but that's <laughs> that's my take on it. No, that's, that's fine, brother. Um, our understanding of God changes our attitude towards God. So four foundational questions for every faith person needs to ask. Who is God? Mm -hmm. uh, who, who is human? What is the problem and what is the solution? So as a Christian, we are under the obligation of looking into Bible to figure out who God is and what he's done for us. So we know who God is. We know what scripture tells us. What is the problem? Our God is trying God. What is the problem of human? Who are the humans who are made in God's image? What is the problem? Our sinful hearts and what is the solution? Lord Jesus Christ is the solution. So those four foundational questions shapes our attitude and our thoughts and our feelings towards God. Therefore, if you've got little view of God and if you are limiting God, then yes, you will have a problem as you look into scripture because you start with your mindset instead of letting God to speak and express who God is. Um, 
I I guess that answers your question. Yes. If it doesn't, don't verbalize it anyway. No. <laughs> it answers my question. <laughs> so thank you, Sister K. Thanks, um, Joy. And uh, thank I just um I just want to correct myself. Um, earlier I was I was trying to allude to a verse in the Bible. Um, and so what the pa what the passage says that I was trying to uh, quote in my mind, but I wasn't actually quoting. Uh, it, it was um, it's the spirit who gives life to fr the flesh profit not the flesh profits nothing. The words that I Jesus speaking the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And the patches that I was thinking of what I said was um, verse uh, sixty seven. This is P Simon Peter answering him and saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so I was just using this to say that we're going to see like this major, major, major contrast between the spirit, the words of life versus like, you know, dead, you know, whatever we see in, in the Quran. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, brother. Yes, Sister K. Yes. In addition to that, um, we're talking about a personal God. Um, when you look at Psalms 139 and uh, the first two verses says, oh, Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Um, this this echoes of a very personal God. And to, to act like he cannot be interacting with you is, is not um, being honest with your scripture if you're looking at it in terms of just the, um, the Tanakh. Um, you, you're ignoring, you're purposely ignoring scripture, what scripture says, because you want to shut your ears. Um, you can shut your ears today, but um, when you finish life in this world, because we are all going to die, it will be too late to open your ears and open your hearts. Basic question still stands out. Are you hoping and planning and being intentional to make a room in your heart for baby King Jesus. So, so far we are looking at uh, the passages in the scripture where we get to see how God steps into the world and engages with his people. So we looked at um, Genesis chapter 15 where we saw word of God steps in and then speaks, have a conversation with Abraham. And then we looked at um, Genesis chapter 32, Jacob's account, how the angel of the Lord, how word of God comes and then engages with Jacob and res wrestles with him. We looked at Exodus chapter 14, and there are, of course, many other passages. For example, another well-known passage is um, Genesis chapter 16, where Hagar is speaking with the angel of the Lord where God again steps into the world and that take care of the woman who is running away from her master and then confront, um, what is the word? Um, confront her. Is that? Com comfort, her. Comfort, comfort her. Comfort her. Comfort yes, that's comfort the word her. I was looking. Um, and then, so you've got that, you've got Genesis chapter 22, which we see as the pre-image of crucifixion of Lord Jesus Christ where Abraham is sacrificing um, his son or being asked to sacrifice his son. Uh, judges were in judges it expressed that people are just following what is right in their own eyes. It's very much messed up. Judges are very much messed up. It shows how human heart is very awful soon after they've been redeemed uh, got it amazing miracles yet people choose to kind of practice uh, they what is good in their own eyes in that we get to see judges chapter 6 where God steps into the world and engages with Gideon Samson in judges chapter 13 God steps in and engages with his people and also another um, quick helpful passage is um for Moses, uh, Moses engages with the angel of the Lord, uh, identified Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, uh, in Exodus chapter 3, in the burning bush, uh, and also Exodus chapter 33, whole heaven comes down for Moses, like Moses is an amazing character, uh, whole heaven comes down for him. 
so and then of course there are lots of other passages we can see in the scripture where god is stepping into the world and engaging with his people and we kind of answered why on earth king of universe uh logic of cosmos would do that answer was exodus chapter 25 verse 8 he wants to dwell with his people uh his people are not unique we are all very much messed up but his heart is humble therefore he steps in and then wants to have relationship with his people wants to communicate with his people through prophets we get to see how god is pursuing his people to turn to him and approximate 2000 years ago somewhere in middle of nowhere which no one ever gave attention no one bothered suddenly there is a birthday celebration for a baby who born not in a palace not in a house but in a major lord jesus christ steps into the world as god man with his incarnation word of god takes up human nature and becomes god man forever so let's go back approximately 2000 years ago um so what is your kind of reactions or your thoughts or what you, would you like to share with us beloveds regarding the first birthday for lord jesus christ okay. um gentleman's first beloved of christ do you want to go first sure uh yeah so that that um you know we can go to many of the gospels for this but we spoke about john one earlier as it was related to the word of yahweh the word of the lord it like echoes this concept in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and darkness did not comprehend it if we skim down to verse 14 in the word that created all things the word that was in the beginning with the father before anything was that existed became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory people ask you know was john an eyewitness did john did john write the gospel of john it says right here he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as the as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so yes the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us this is the incarnation this is the first christmas as you said the yeah, yeah first this birthday. is a, yeah. the first birthday yeah the first, yes exactly so yeah that that's uh you know i didn't really have to comment too much i just read the word of god so that's yeah. all i have to say Th thank you for that brother and we get to see that uh what is the meaning of name jesus in matthew gospel when we move back to matthew gospel mm. he will save his people from their sin she will give birth yeah. to a son and you are to give him the name jesus because he will save his people from their sin and they will call him emmanuel which means god with us God steps into the world to be with his people and we've got heavenly beings are coming and celebrating the birth of King Jesus. Um, beloved, would you like to add anything? Um, when you see the account in Luke, uh, what really um, surprised me was that you, you talk about the first birthday of the Lord. There was no place for him. There was mm -hmm. no place for him in the inn. So there wasn't even <laughs> in, you know, just the way he was received. He was so humble. He was so humbled. People, when they are uh, born today, they have place, a place in hospital, a bed in hospital. But the, our Lord, the King, 
um, had to be birthed, um, you know, in a in a place out of the way because it, it was it was too crowded. And also, sister, um, the first people celebrating his birth were humble shepherds, um, along with the angels. Again, you know, the it's, it's, humility is outcast just amazing. It. Outcast, outcast the, yeah. yeah, outcast people steps in to celebrate the birthday of king. Mm-hmm. In here, you mm-hmm. don't even get invitation to the birthday of queen, mm-hmm. but two thousand years ago, outcasted individuals are joining the celebration of the birthday of king of universe. Not any king, but king of universe. And um, when they, uh, when Mary and Joseph were giving the sacrifices in the temple for him. They couldn't uh, afford the usual, so they had to sacrifice the pigeons. Mm-hmm. Again, um, I don't know how, you know, it just humbles me so much that the, the most, the greatest king, um, his, his beginnings in, on earth, in, on his life on earth was so humble, sister. Um, like father gives his son to the world, yeah. to the people who are so poor. They goes and they go and sacrifice pigeons because they are poor, yeah. and father trusts his one and only son into the, this poor couple. On the time of birth, there is not even hotels or palaces available for them to um, give birth. The the love father has for humanity, the love father has for his son, the love son has for humanity is mind-blowing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, what are your thoughts for the first birthday of the King of Universe? Um, my thoughts go into Luke 2, also, um, verses 11 through 14. And it says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill, toward men um that gives you a little bit of insight of like what was going on not just on earth but like amongst the heavenly host to see god coming in the form and human flesh and then later on you have simeon um he wanted to see you know the messiah so that also like gives you a foundation that there were people looking for um, the Messiah waiting the, for waiting waiting for his, his arrival. So um, it just supports that you know. Th- first and foremost, this is not a new concept that we just invented. This is something that was long awaited for throughout Scripture. The King of Universe steps into the world. Have birthday party, heavenly beings are stepping in, outcasted steps in to to welcome the one who spoke to Abraham, to welcome who wrestled with Jacob, wrestled with Jacob, to welcome who engaged with Moses, to welcome who engaged with Gideon, Samson, Hagar, and all the people we don't even most of times bother to think about. But mighty God, Prince of Peace, steps in into the poor family by screaming his heart out as expressing who he is. He's humble, glorious, gorgeous, delightful, amazing Lord comes to the world as a baby. And even in his birth, he's been worshipped. He, why he comes? So that he can, he can take the sins of humanity on himself. Why he comes? Because God wants to make his dwelling with his people. Why he comes? Because our God is triune God. 
his heart wants his people to turn to him. And as he gives his life, like, Incarnation Fest just doesn't like, kind of stop with the birth of Jesus or that birthday party, but it actually continues to the crucifixion and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Purpose he came, work is done so that he will save his people from their sin. Why? Because we have a God who is with us. We have a God who expresses that he is with us in the Old Testament. Even, I don't know, I was just like thinking on, sorry, I was talking, but also I was thinking on judges. Like, judges is like pretty messed up people. Like, we are messed up as well, but, like, you kind of read Judges and then you say, I am much better than them. Yet we are not, but, like, you kind of read how they are following what is good in their eyes, how they are just messing up and messing up, yet God doesn't give them up. God still steps in and engages with those people and then asks those people to turn to him. Why? Because our God is delightful. Our God is amazing. He doesn't give his people up. His heart is humble and lowly. And that goes to the cross. And that goes with the resurrection of this baby king. As he, will, as he lives among his people, he turns up in this poor, broken world with, to the poor people. He doesn't kind of say, oh, why it is not a palace or why I am like this. He steps in because Father loves the world. He gives his one and only son, and that one and only son gives himself for us. Why? Because our heart is messed up. We are all messed up. We, are, we don't have any other option. We are desperately need to make a room in our hearts for King Jesus. Versus God is under zero obligation. He's willing to meet with our needs, our needs of Savior. Um, so that's approximately 2,000 years ago, first birthday of King Jesus, baby King Jesus. <laughs> um, he's not called Prince, by the way. Like, I was thinking about this this morning. He's not called Prince Jesus. He's called King Jesus. Um, so throughout scripture, we saw scripture, just screamed out that God steps into the world and then expresses why he does that. Uh, what does Islam teach us? Does Islam say Allah is capable to step into the world? Yes or no? If, he, if yes, what is his reasoning? If it is no, poor Allah, bless his heart, messed up very much. Muslim world, very much messed up. Uh, so let's go with gentlemen first. But before that... Um, Brother, you've been quiet for a while. Um, anything you would like to add or say before answering my question of capability of Allah? Sure, yeah. I just wanted to say that this was unplanned, that I went to the Gospel of John, Sister Tune went to the Gospel of Matthew, oh. and then Sisters Kay and Daughter went to Luke. That was unplanned. It's just yeah, it really amazing plan. how that worked out. And uh, so... So yeah, this is uh, this is uh, a great uh, way to segue now into what does the Quran say about this topic, if at all? Does it speak on this topic? Does it prohibit this act of God appearing? Does it say it happens? And if it does say that it happens, then what can Muslims possibly object to? And I think we're going to get into that soon and see that in fact it does teach that Allah, although this is a false god. It says that he appeared to his creation throughout the Quran and we see throughout the Islamic literature, such as the Hadith. Yeah. So just uh, before we move to that, I just want to kind of clarify the reason God of Bible steps into the world. He wants to make his dwelling with his people. Exodus 25, 8. OK. Um, why? Because our God is trying God. He is relational. It all goes back. What kind of God you worship? So Allah is going to step into the world, but in very, very wrong reasons, <laughs> pretty much very wrong reasons. Um, so just like, don't kind of think, oh, 
since Allah steps into the world, therefore Allah and God of Bible is the same. No, as Brother Jai said, Allah is very much like very much, very much false God. So whatever I, I, he sister, does, as the song as God. the song says, as the song goes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so let me just find. Uh, there are four hundred sixty-seven slides. Let me find the relevant slide wow. on it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so we have over 400 references. It's amazing. So um, we're going to see... <laughs> 67, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're going to see very, very fast, very soon that the Quran does teach that their God is capable of appearing, of taking on a form, of being visible to the human eye, becoming localized. This is very clear through the Islamic sources. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, we can get into why Muslims, you know, I, I, I said earlier that I think the reason why Muslims are down is because they are more dogmatic about creeds than they are about what their book actually says. So they're more committed to a creed or to a doctrine than they are to what they believe their um, word of God actually says. We, of course, don't believe it's the word of God, but that's what they're, I think that's what's going on. So even their false book that teaches false doctrine and will lead to is, damnation. Yeah, this is okay. Yeah, it's a um, even I, even their false book. Hmm? Yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go with Plan B. Why? Because my slides are for speakers corner and they are small. So let's go to Plan B, which is go to Shake Google, and then find it from Shake Google. Can I say um, Quran dot com? Yes, yes, sir. Um, and, and the reason why we're saying this is because oftentimes I hear is Jesus can't be God because he God can't come into ex into his creation. So this this will challenge, you know, the thoughts that Allah, if he enters into his creation, then he can't be God. Yeah. Exactly. According exactly. to Muslim minds. According to Muslim yeah. minds. But so here's one way to phrase that. If it's valid to reject Christianity based on this doctrine of God appearing or let's say theophanies or the incarnation, if that's a valid reason to reject Christianity, then if the Muslim is consistent, then they should reject the Quran because as we're going to show, the Quran also teaches that their false God can become visible, can become tangible, localized yeah. and all that stuff. Okay, shall we go with um, Surah 27 or when would you like to go first, brother? Yeah, that's fine by me. Chapter 27, verses 7, uh, 7, uh, sorry, 8, uh, 9. Seven, 7 to 9, yeah. 7 to 9? Okay. Yeah, that's uh, fine by me. Let's, let's, let's put see that, that on the screen. Make it look nice because I'm working on my niceness. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good. By like the way, sister. I give um, compliments if I correct about myself. Everyone kind of supports my compliment. Um, sorry, brother. We have to. We're on. This I can recommend. <laughs> yeah, if I can recommend the translation, uh, I, I, the, if you want to use the the Bridges translation, only because I like to point out whenever there's a different version of the Quran that says something else. That's the only reason why different I like the translation. Different version or different Quran. D different. Yeah. Well, different. Well, whatever they want to call it. Different. Different Quran. Different Quran. <laughs> Thank you. Different version of the Quran, whatever. Different Arabic yeah, that, 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 Quran. That, that. Just different yeah, accents. So. Different accents of the Quran. <laughs> yeah, different <Vernacular>. accents. <laughs> uh, so, so I like I like to use this one when it, whenever it makes those notes. The the red ind indicates that there's a different Arabic Quran, and so yeah, that's that's basically the only reason why I like using it. I don't think it's like a a great translation, but I just like that it points that out. Yeah. So okay, we are in Surah twenty seven. Uh, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Our main focus is 7 to 9, but we read a couple of verses um, before and after so that Muslims kind of don't say like, oh, we've been, Quran has been treated unfairly. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to get rid of... I just want to note, sister, just before we read the Quran, it's like, I, I just... It's like, uh, it just feels so disgusting after we just read the Bible. Like, I feel like I need to go take a shower or something. I, know. I, I felt so sad when I had to put the Bible aside and open yeah. it. Yeah. 
But but for the sake of the Muslims, for the sake of the Muslims and those who witness to Muslims, we think this is important because if you're witnessing to Muslims or if you are a Muslim, this is important because if you're rejecting Christianity on the basis that God appears or God can enter into his, cre into his creation, then you should also reject the Quran. Obviously, we don't think that's a valid reason to reject Christianity, but if we're going to hold you to consistency, then that's a problem for you, not for us, for you. Yeah. Uh, yes, everyone is ready to go to Quran. We know this is offensive and it's very much messed up, especially after our glorious, uh, talking uh, about our glorious God, but let's deal with it. So we are looking um, in, we looked in the Christian scripture when and how God steps into the world. And now we are turning our attention to Islamic teachings and then we want to see what does Islam say? Is Allah capable to step into creation? And if he does so, how does he do that? What is his intentions at the first place? Um, so we turned our attention to Surah 27 on the story. Uh, we've got like proper and correct version in Exodus chapter 3. We've got like little bit sabotage, destroyed and butchered version of that. And in Surah 27 and a couple of other surahs uh, where Allah is in the burning bush. So, um, beloved, would you like to read it? Yes. Verse 7 says, Recall when Moses said to his family, I have surely glimpsed a fire. I will bring you some news from it or bring you a firebrand, a borrowed flame that you may warm yourselves. Verse 8. Then when he reached it, he was called, Blessed is whoever is in the fire, and whoever is around it, and highly exalted is Allah, Lord of the realms. Oh, uh, Moses. Just to, pause, just, to pause, just to pause you really quickly. Yes. Um, people might be wondering, okay, blessed is whoever is in the fire and whoever is around it. We don't need to wonder who that is because the next verse sister what does it say oh moses it is indeed i allah the almighty the all wise nothing uh -huh. per nothing personal <laughs> in this one but brother jai i love yusuf ali's translation he simply says i am allah yeah there nice you go. Nice to meet you, Moses. I am Allah. In case, in case you got confused. Straight to the point. Yeah, I remember Allah does handshake with Umar. I am sure Allah did handshake with Islamic Moses. Mm. So he um, is. He's in the fire. So he's in the mm. Sinai. So in, let's or, think of some of the in his creation. So that's his creation. Oh. Yeah, let's let's think of some of the questions that Muslims like to ask us when we have discussions about theophanies or the incarnation. They'll ask us, oh, who was in control of the universe? <laughs> who was in control of the universe? Okay, so let's ask the Muslim. Who was in control of the universe when Allah was in the fire? So, Obviously, we don't think these are valid objections. But if you're going to use them against us on this topic, well, we want to see how you're going to answer these questions because we don't think that they apply validly or in a valid manner. But if you think they do, well, okay, answer the question. Who was in control of the universe when your God was in the fire? Who was on the throne? Who was <laughs> all the questions we can ask? What, what, do you, what do your sisters think? Yeah, so with that one, it makes sense in triune God because triune God is three persons. So while Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God is dwelling among us, living among us, triune God is in charge of universe versus Allah is monad, one being by itself. Mm -hmm. So when Allah is spending five seconds, 20 seconds, even hours in the burning bush, bush having chit chat with Moses, and then, and then says, uh, yeah, having chit chat with Moses, then the question is, who is running the universe? It's all messed up. Yeah. Allah's creation messed up. And remember, I, I mentioned this while back. If the Quranic verse finishes, with something expresses Allah is all knowing, Allah is all wise, that verse needs your attention. This verse finishes with Allah the wise. Mm -hmm. So why Allah is saying yeah. that? Because Allah knows now people are going to ask the question. I am here mm -hmm. who is yeah. running the universe. So let me 
break that question, close all the doors so that people don't ask that question, we say Allah is wise. Allah is all knowing who was running the universe when he was having chit chat with Moses. Yeah. Uh, so, sister, there, there are, as, as, as your sisters know, there are parallels to this. And some of it says, some of them say the fire, some of them say the tree. For example, in chapter 28, verse 30, we have another parallel to this. And then in chapter 20, verse um, 11 and 12, we have another parallel to this. So, uh, so when he's in the fire, when he's in the tree, if we're going to combine the stories, um, is because, you know, they say that when, when he enters into the womb of Mary, that makes him unclean or unholy or impure. So when he's in the fire or when he's in the tree, is he impure? Is he unholy? Does it does it uh, not befit his majesty to be inside the womb? But it, it does that. It, but it's the case that he can appear in the tree in the fire. <laughs> How like th these are very uh, you know these are questions we want to ask. We want to know. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't see. Actually, let me get our attention to chat. So I put the twenty-eight thirty on the screen for people to follow up. Let me get my attention to chat. Uh, since we've got some um, Dawa gangs in the chat, I'm sure they are able to answer those very much basic questions. Yeah. I see that. When Allah was in the tree, was he limited? They ask us these questions. Is he limited? So is Allah limited when he's localized in the tree, when he's in the fire? So why is it the case that being in human flesh makes him impure, but he can be inside of a tree and that doesn't make him impure? He can be inside of a fire and that doesn't make him impure. Why the inconsistency, Muslims? Um, Mr. Muslims, um, this is a good opportunity for you to just clarify. Um, your God, we know that like he makes perfect sense, he expressed his wise, but please just take the opportunity to answer very basic questions. It says, Allah no. was not in the luminous fire. Stop this nonsense. Shall we read it again? It says, blessed is he is whoever is in the fire. So who's that? So yeah. who's and we, we don't need to rest. The next verse tells us. <laughs> Blessed is whoever is in the fire. Next, Moses. Uh, next verse. Oh, Moses, it is indeed I, Allah, the Almighty. Don't get confused, Moses. I am Allah. It's like the when it says, like, it is indeed, like, like it, truly, truly, it, truly, yeah. I say to you. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, so imagine, truly, 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 I say to you, it is Allah. So, so, so if Moses, if Moses was, if Moses was a good Muslim, which, you know, obviously he wasn't a Muslim, but if he was a good Muslim, like a modern, let's say if he was a Dawah type of Muslim, what would he have said to this tree or to this fire? What would he say? Astaghfirullah, Allah, you can't be in the tree. You can't be in there. You can't, you can't, that can't be you. You can't, like my Sheikh tells me that you can't be in the tree. You can't be in the fire. You can't be localized. You can't, you can't become visible. You can't take on uh, all, of the, all of these things. Uh, like, that, but obviously Moses was not a Muslim. That, that's so fine. If, if Allah is not in the fire, please tell me in verse 8, who is it that is blessed? When it says blessed is whoever is in the fire in verse 8, who and is that? Around it. And around it. Tell us who that yeah. is, if it's not Allah. <laughs> and give us your reason. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, a help, a for, quick, like helpful point, point for us to remember is... Uh, your sheikhs are not going to be with you when you give account to your creator. So you don't want to be standing in front of your creator and then say like, oh, well, I didn't take your word seriously. I needed to follow the teachings of my sheikh who taught me to not think critically. I needed to listen to my mom, my father. Therefore, I put your word in the end of the list, even though your word kind of, you are a good communicator, God. Like, you are the one who created everything, Mr. Allah. So, therefore, like, whatever you say should be standing. When you say it, you were in that bush, you stepped into the world, uh, I just thought, no, in that occasion, you are a bad communicator because my <laughs> sheikh disagrees with you. I yeah. need to make a choice between my sheikh, keep him happy, <laughs> but, and your, you, and your words, mm. so I picked my sheikh.
Yeah, there's no getting around this that their God became physical in some way. Yeah. Because when he's saying, indeed, and Muslims, there's a there's also a verse in the Quran that talks about um, Allah speaking to most. I mean, obviously, right here you have this, mm -hmm. but I'm saying another parallel um, tells us that uh that that he spoke to to moses so um if you if you if you uh put this together so we have god we have allah speaking audibly to moses um if we think of in terms of physics well sound is vibrations vibrations these are these are physical properties so when you make when you're making when your voice when you when you're making a sound when there's a sound being made there's vibrations happening these are physical properties it's physical so your god in some way his voice something about it became physical became part of his creation no matter how you want to cut it no matter how you want to cut it when your god speaks that, that that's vibrations that are that are going into moses's ear and that's your God's words. It's I am Allah. He's saying I am Allah. Well, that's physical. So no matter how, no matter how, um, you know, how much they want to deny this, we can we. It, it's it's impossible. It's in your text. You can't. I mean, you can't get around it. The only reason why you reject it is because you think that it's not. You know, it goes against what you. It goes against what you believe in your doctrines, your creeds, but it doesn't go against what your book actually says. Yeah. So now we looked at Surah 27 and 28, similar versions, how Allah ends up in the burning bush. And then also there's something unique in Moses. Like Allah never reveals himself to Muhammad, but to Islamic Moses. In Surah 7, verse 142. Yeah, um, and so so like the other one was a parallel to Exodus three. Yeah. This is a par the supposed this is a, a, a rip off, but a terrible parallel, but supposedly a parallel to Exodus thirty three. Yeah, butchered version of Exodus thirty three. Um, yeah. beloved, would you like to read it? Yes, seven one four three it says, and when Moses came to our appointed tryst and his Lord had spoken unto him, he said, My Lord, show me thyself that I may gaze upon thee. He said, "Thou Wait, wilt can not we pause? see." Pause. Hold on. Pause. Why didn't he stop him right there and say, "Oh, that's not possible"? That don't you know that that's not that's not what Islam teaches? Islam teaches that that's impossible. Don't you know that that's what the guy at Speaker's Corner, the Dawa guy, says? It, the the Dawa he says that God can't be seen. So why, are, Moses? You're a prophet, and this guy's a this guy's a, a, a Dawa Gandist. But but how does he know better that this is impossible? But you're a prophet. And and how is it that you're asking me? How is it you're asking me? Can like let me see you? Can I see you? How how is that? So what is the actual answer, sister? What does he say? He says, "You will not see me, but gaze upon the mountain. If it will, if it stands still in its place, then you will see me." And ah, when... okay. So if I say to you right now, if I say to you right now, you are not seeing me. Does that mean that I don't have a physical form or it just means you're not actually able to see me right now because my camera is not on? No, Allah should have said to him, look, I don't enter into my creation. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> Make it. That's what he should have said, right? It's a great opportunity for Allah to yeah. set, the, set the things clear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Moses and Adam supposedly have these big theological debates. Moses has all this knowledge of the Torah. Yeah. He has all this knowledge of the scrolls that, you know, all these things. But yet he thinks he can see God. How is it that this great prophet thinks he can see God? How is it that he doesn't know this basic, quote unquote, basic Islamic theology? Yeah. Or, like, at the first place, why Moses goes against today's Dawagans, as well as their sheikhs, that mm. is able to ask God to show me more of you. And then, of yeah. course, Allah is like being very not kind in here. Allah says, look at the mountain and then makes makes um, Moses faint. But, uh, and, now, yeah. But, but yeah, I kept interrupting, but but the, he actually does appear. He does appear. It says it very clearly in the Arabic and in the English. Yes. It's very clear. He does appear. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry continue on. Sorry. When his Lord appeared to the mountain. Mm. Yeah. So he, he must have entered his creation to appear the mountain, right? Yep. Exactly. Because why didn't the mountain crumble when he was just talking, wherever he's talking to him, maybe this is, um, you know, from, I mean, I don't know the exact context the Quran is speaking of here. If, if this is like a conversation where like Allah is in the heavens talking on the Moses, I don't know. But, but 
if if this is the if this is like if if there's no change in Allah's position, then why doesn't the mountain? Why aren't every why isn't every mountain crumbling? The mountain. What, what's had, the difference? The mountain. The mountain didn't crumble because Allah hadn't appeared to it yet. Exactly. Allah had to go into His creation, appear to uh-huh. the mountain, then it crumbled. There you See? go. So, when um, He appeared to the mountain, was He limited? <laughs> Did He become impure? Did He, you know, who's running the universe? Who's in the heavens? Right. All of these questions we can ask. Like they ask us. Um, so let's um, can shall we read the verse from the beginning again? So that yeah, people, sorry, I, can, yeah. I get excited. I can't oh, no, it's, it, it's fine. It's fine. It's good that as we read, we ask the questions because that will help Muslims to kind of just do something about their brains. Um, beloved, would you like to read it again for us? And when Moses arrived at our appointed time and his Lord spoke to him, he said, My Lord, show me yourself that I may look at you. Allah said, You will not see me, but look at the mountain. If it should remain in place, then you will see me. But when his Lord appeared to the mountain, he rendered it level, and Moses fell unconscious. And when he awoke, he said, Exalted are you, I have repented to you, and I am the first of the believers. Okay. So, so I guess, so the, the rebuke here is that he thinks he can live and see God. It's not that you can't see God at all. Right, that's the rebuke. He, he so, like, and this is the, this is like I said, this is the, like Sister Tunta, this, this is the butchering, the, um, Exodus the corrupted two. version, the yeah, the corrupted version, the uh, like they talk about the Bible being corrupted. Yeah, this is the, this is the corruption. Your Quran, it's corrupting the Bible stories. So if you read Exodus thirty three, you see that Moses actually does see God. He actually does see god um there's a difference between behold well anyway we don't have to get into that right now but you see here that the rebuke isn't oh you can't see me because i don't have a form or i can't become visible that's not the rebuke the rebuke is or the lesson learned from this is oh i can't live and see you i can't see you and live because look what happened to the mountain the mountain saw him i guess the mountain saw him and then it crumbled so again why isn't every mountain in the world crumbling because Allah didn't appear to those mountains as daughter of Christ put it. So he appeared to this one. He, in other words, it's different. There's a difference. There, there's something happening. He's entering creation. He's becoming visible to the mountain, uh, I guess. <laughs> I mean, how else would you understand he, he appeared to the mountain? The mountain is like in his glory. It's in his presence. Yeah. Um, Sister Kay, you are kind of pulling yourself together to make a point. <laughs> Um, no, I, w- I was actually reading the comments that no human being, um, I'm sorry, it says no human being can see and withstand the light of the sun from a close distance because he will be burned and die. And the sun is a small creature. So imagine the light of Allah. So uh, Surah 18 talks about people are getting sunburned, but anyway, <laughs> because they are doing fishing. So mean, no is, is it the same sun that um, people <laughs> that is setting into the muddy uh, the, the muddy water? Is that yeah. the, that the one? That one? So okay, the, it, uh, I mean, I can see that and live. Yes, <laughs> fine. So I mean, it's right here. It's you're refuting your own Quran right now. You're telling your Quran that it's wrong. So yeah. So um, what we have so far, we are looking at. How uh, how Islamic uh, how Islam teaches not your sheikhs not your dawah gangs but how Islam is teach how Islam teaches that Allah steps into His creation Surah seven Surah twenty seven verse um, seven to nine and now Surah seven verse one hundred forty two in somehow Allah steps into the world His into His creation. Um, and in both of occasions, it is Islamic Moses is witness to that. Um, any other points so far in this? Because I'm going to move uh, to the next slide. I've got. I, I found a contradiction in the you Quran. <laughs> you find, what? sister? Come on, there is no contradiction in the Quran. Basic Islam teaches. <laughs> uh, so you know how he was chit chatting directly with Moses, right? Yeah. Um, Surah 42, verse 51. It says Allah can't do that. So Allah couldn't do chit-chatting? No. Nope. It says it is not for any human that Allah should speak to him. 
except by revelation or from behind a veil or sending a messenger. Oh, that's when it comes to Muhammad. Muhammad. No, but it Muhammad. says any human. No, sister. Muhammad wasn't worthy enough for Allah to speak to him. We just saw Surah 7, verse 143. Surah 7, Surah 27, 7 to 9. Mm -hmm. Allah thinks Moses mm -hmm. is worthy enough, Allah having chit chat with him. So when it comes to Muhammad, Allah gives him that excuse. Now, now parallel that passage, that sister, daughter of Christ, just cited parallel that with chapter 4, verse 164. 4, 164. Yeah, look at those two like, side by side. <laughs> You'll see the big problem. Another contradiction you found? Well, well, oh, I'm, no I'm kind of like just highlighting, yeah, just kind of highlighting it for the people that this is the contradiction. And it says, uh, 4164 says, and messengers whom we've already narrated to you, and messengers whom we have not narrated to you, and Allah spoke to Moses with direct speech. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, so he spoke directly with him, not through the hijab or whatever else the other one said, a messenger. Yeah, so... Yeah, the veil, the veil, yeah. yeah. Even like Islamic Islamic Moses is much better than Muhammad. Allah becomes shy when it comes to Muhammad. Allah speaks with Moses, Muhammad um, with other other ways. Um, but when it comes to Moses, in the Bible, whole heaven comes down for Moses. In Islamic teachings, Allah takes time and have very basic conversation with Mo Moses, speaks to him directly. So that's Surah 4, verse 164, Surah 7, verse 143, Su Surah 27, verse 7 to 9. Um, and what was the one that daughter said was a contradiction? What was that one? Surah 42, verse 51. It says uh, Allah doesn't speak directly to anyone except through revelation <laughs> or messenger. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, there you go. Contradiction. It, does that does that not verse doesn't finish with like Allah is shy? No. I'm no, joking. that's another that's another no, joking. it says Allah's not shy. No, in this occasion, like that might be the like good way to finish that. <laughs> Muhammad um, was shy. Allah's not shy. You never know, sister. Um okay. So let me move to the um different story, like or a little bit more of this one. Let's go to Hadith. Um Beloved, would you like to read this one? Yes. Uh, narrated Suleiman ibn Harb. Narrated ibn uh, Salama narrated to us from Thabit, from Anas, that the Prophet said, um, recited this ayah. So when his Lord appeared to the mountain, he made it collapse to dust. Hamad said, like this, Suleiman held his thumb over the tip of his, <laughs> of his finger of the right hand, so that the on, only the tip of one finger was protruding, and he, the prophet, said, so the mountain fainted, and Musa fell down unconscious. So can you uh, demonstrate to us? <laughs> That's how that mountain crashed. Um, this is the tafsir for um, Surah 7, verse 143, where, um, according to Ibn Abbas, uh, Allah gets into his creation and then they put that as his glory and when Moses came to our appointed tryst in Midian so they've got an appointment with Allah to go to a certain place <laughs> yeah Moses be there at five o'clock <laughs> don't be late I, I will be there I'm busy you know like I've got one shin I have to stand like anyway that's, jo what, that's, just joking. that's what a tryst is a meeting like when you say meet me here at 5 p.m. that's where he was going to meet Allah in Midian and his Lord had spoken unto him and said, my, he said, My Lord, show me thyself. He wished to see Allah, that I may gaze upon thee. He, Allah, said, Thou will not see me. You will not be able to see me in the life of this world, O Moses. But gaze upon the mountain, the highest mountain in Midian. If it stands still in its place, if the mountain stands still when seeing me, then thou will see me. And... When his Lord revealed his glory to the mountain, to Mount Zubair, he sent it crashing down, and Moses fell down senseless. He passed out. And when he woke from his fainting, he said, Glory unto thee. I turn unto thee repentant from asking to see you, and I am the first of true believers that will not be seen in the life of this world. I have so many questions, sister. 
Uh, you might be asking very basic question, who is the first believer? Yes. <laughs> Wasn't it meant first to be Adam? Believer. Yeah. Um, but in this occasion, so see, lo, uh, verse, verse says, Lord appeared to a mountain in here, his glory. Like, see, as the time goes on, they get to kind of read Christian scripture mm -hmm. and then they try to like, okay, let's put that information, steal that information, butcher that information. Um, any thoughts so far on this? Just what you said. Oh, you're about asking. The, oh. Sorry, brother. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, I'm just getting clear. No, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, daughter. I don't know if you're asking me or not. Go ahead, daughter. I was just finding um, the places in the Quran where uh, Muhammad says, I'm the first of believers. And then I'm for Adam, it says, well. Yeah, so who's the first? <laughs> So, you don't, sister, I told you there is no contradiction in the word of Allah beside all other contradictions. So let's <laughs> let's like focus on Allah entering his creation. Sorry, the verses mm. for that um quote for that is Surah 6, verse 162 and 163. Allah says to Muhammad, Say, indeed, my prayers and my rights and my way of living and dying are for Allah. No associate with him, and I am the first of the Muslims. So when uh, the people, uh, Muslims say Jesus is the first, is Jesus is a Muslim or Adam is a Muslim. Why you Abraham, Muslims? Jesus, Moses. And then they also say one of Fer someone during the time of Pharaoh too, remember? Th yeah, there's but, a whole list of the first Muslims. <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing. Um, so in Oxford Dictionary, when you say first, you mean first. But when you look at the Islam, yeah, when you look at the Islam, when you say first, you mean like, Lots of people first, and then like they are all first, right? I know it's it's, it's it doesn't make that much sense, but it's. Well, like I remember it's remember um when earlier I was talking about how when we're reading the Bible, where you know we assume words have meanings and we <laughs> yeah. like go by. The, yeah, well, when we that's when I said when we go to Islam in the Quran, the words don't have meanings. Yeah, so, so they don't actually mean. Uh, <laughs> well, well, Muslims want us to believe that at least. Yeah. So Islamic dictionary. By the uh, way, um, sorry, brother. Go on, oh, brother. sorry, sorry. Um, no, I was just saying. By the <laughs> way, if we if we um look at chapter seventy five, chapter seventy five verses twenty two to twenty three, we're gonna see that that believers, that Muslim believers, are one day going to be able to look at their Lord. So yeah. he's gonna be visible to them, and it's the same verb that's used when Moses says. That he wants to see it's the same verb you check the arabic it's the same exact verb when he's saying you know let me see you and this verse is saying they will see their lord and you know the race their faces will become radiant and all that stuff so yes um this idea that you know um and by the way that's that's creation by the way in in the paradise um which is not real paradise but and and what they claim is paradise is still creation this is something that was created yeah um, yeah, kind of background is like Allah is going to come to them on Friday prayer stuff. So that's reference to Surah 75, 22 to 23. Um, shall we talk a little bit more about what the Tafsir says about how Moses, um, Allah is revealing himself to Moses and then Moses gets fainted? So Jalalayan is on the screen. They say glory. Yeah, they ch yeah they change that. It, but in the verse, it doesn't say my glory will appear. It says I will appear. Hmm. Sister, don't push that much. Let give him like the little chance. You know, like. Wow. Well. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you think you're like Mimi pushing Yasser Qadi or something like that, but you know, like they don't like yeah, pushing. Don't you push can't, me. you know. Yeah, don't, don't push. Don't. Don't don't push. Don't push Allah. Um. Okay. So. Um, what Wait, is saw... that? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> he has one leg. <laughs> has one leg. Oh Which... wow! Oh, I need to give him so much hair. Um. So anyway, so what we have is, what we saw how Allah entered this creation in Surah Seven, Surah Twenty Seven, and then we saw how Muslims are in according to Surah Seventy Five. 22-23, how Muslims are going to see Allah in Islamic paradise, and then also Allah will be seen on the different forms 
om dig. Sister? Uh, the day that the shin will be laid bare and they shall be summoned to prostrate and they shall not be able to. That's Surah 68 verse 42. Narrated Abu Sa'id, I heard the Prophet said, saying, Allah will lay bare his shin and then all the believers, men and women, will prostrate themselves before him. But there will remain those who used to prostrate in the world for showing off and for gaining good reputation. Such a one will try to prostrate himself on the day of judgment, but his backbones will become a single vertebral bone and he will not be able to prostrate. That's Sahih Bukhari, 664 for one. Yeah, and then next time it's actually in the context, it says Allah is going to come on the different form than he appeared appear at the first place and then people will recognize him from his shin. So Allah is going to take different forms and shapes which is very much not good at all. So how do they recognize him? They've never seen him before. His shin is miracle, sister. Magical shin. Oh. Okay. Don't he push it. Don't push Allah into the logical questions. Oh, yeah. Allah moves. Narrated Abu Huraira said, Allah Apostle said, Our Lord the Blessed, the Superior, comes every night down on the nearest heaven <laughs> to us the last night, third of the night remains, saying, Is there anyone to invoke me so that I may respond to invocation? Is there anyone to ask me so that I might gra grant him his request? So, so where is Allah coming? Down to the third, um, sorry, down to the lowest heaven in the third, uh, last third of the night. So he's entering his creation. Hmm. Coming down, yes. Yeah. Down, down, down. There's a song. Our lift is not working. We need a lot to help us to get down. So. <laughs> okay, let's let's first give time to Brother Joy. Um, yes, Brother. Um, I was just going to say, when he enters to this level, who's, who's occupying the highest heavens at this point? Like Muslims like yeah. asking us, who is running the universe, who is in the seventh heaven. Um, yeah, we wanted to yeah. kind of remind, as we go through this, we should just remind them of their objections to us when, but, when they object to God night. appearing or God yeah. becoming visible. You know, just remind them. Yeah. But <laughs> you know, have you noticed, like, know. it is something like he does regularly. Mm -hmm. Every, every night. night. Yeah. yeah. But it's more than regularly because it, every and minute... Allah thinks, by the way, Allah thinks earth is flat in this. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. say. Allah... Because every minute, there's a third, it's the last third of the yeah, night Allah somewhere so. on, the, on the earth. So yeah. that means he never leaves the lowest heaven. So, so Who is running the, the universe? Chained to the, the womb is chained to the throne. Maybe in the womb. So the womb is like there and the rooster sometimes is, is there. So. Sister, I used to wait to the last third of the night back when I was in the Jahiliya, in ignorance. <laughs> I used to wait <laughs> to ask my request, like with a, with a watch, like waiting for the last yeah. third. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Allah, even in that story, Allah thinks like earth is flat. He's coming down at a certain time every night. And Brother Jai is asking the question, who is in charge of the universe the moments Allah spends on earth? Like other things like, yeah. is he not capable like enough to hear the people? people's prayer or request when he's in like seventh heaven or on the throne and then wherever he is like is he got bad hearings i know my left ear doesn't work but maybe allah has the same issues maybe he wants to be closer so um, what can't he hear what yeah. is the purpose maybe of they're that? whispering and he's like what was that i can't hear you and he steps down <laughs> yeah he, he likes his me time in the other times of the day and then and um, Serious not, brother Jai. But wait, sister, do you have do you have the hadith where it says that Allah like he runs or he jogs? Oh yeah, you know I do one? have. Yes, yes. Let okay. me find that. <laughs> Something you said reminded me of that. So, yeah, I've got so, Allah. Uh, let me find it. Let me find. Now this, this is. I also. I remember listening to. I remember listening to a group of Shia Muslims. Mm -hmm. Um, mocking the Sunnis because of this hadith because it teaches that their God is like a jogger and you yeah. know like he's like a runner like how, so we want to know like how fast does he run when he when he steps on the ground like how much weight's on the ground we want to know all these questions because they're so obsessed with you know Jesus he you know he had to walk from here to here he had to drink food he, well when your God is jogging we want to know 
is he is he uh, being is there like being energy uh like you I know found escape? It. yeah okay. you got it yeah she's got it she's got everything on this uh, one. 400, I 467 slides so let me before before we look at this hadith it's important i think this is also a great moment to verbalize so daughter of christ walks three miles in one hour 40 minutes <laughs> why you gotta why you gotta okay. show me like that three miles one hour 40 minutes I'm like that's guys. already like very bad <laughs> like are you timing me i did time you i i walk i walk three miles in like 15 minutes no just <laughs> like approximately 30 minutes okay so how long it takes a lot to run? I think you're faster than him, you sister. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what we want to know. We want to know all these questions, all these details, because Muslims they, they ask us all the time about Jesus eating and he drinking. We want to know when your God when your God runs, um, does he lose energy? Then when your God is jogging, does he does he wear a jogger suit? Does he like you know? Yeah, need so to you dress mean like you mean just... like does he lose calorie and then get sweat? All yeah, those kind of things. But yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. When we look at the um, context of the hadith, it seems like you know when you see watch on the movies um, on the by the beach, man and woman is loving one another and they're running towards each other like end of the movie for happy end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is very similar because. Slave of Allah runs to Allah, and then Allah kind of, oh, Allah that's kind so of sweet. runs to them. Yes. It's like probably is running fast and then sweat it and all. The, anyway, beloved, would you like to read it for us? Narrated Anas, the Prophet said, "My Lord says, if my slave comes nearer to me for a span, I go nearer to him for a cubit, and if he comes nearer to me for a cubit, I go nearer to him for the span of an outstretched arms, and if he comes to me walking." I go to him running. Oh, That's like beautiful love so story. Pretty. Just this That's needs to be like, at the end of movies. He's more keen, you know. Yeah, like, he was like, I'm long. You should have that slow music playing for Allah to come towards you. Do you watch too much movies? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, beloved of Christ, what are your thoughts on Allah's running skills? I mean, I want to know, does, does he wear like any sort of clothes when he runs? Is it like, does he wear shorts? Does he wear like joggers? What is he, what is he, what's his workout like? So does he, does he have like energy drinks? Does he have like protein shakes? I, I want to know. These are the questions. These are the questions that Muslims ask us when we're talking about God having a human, God taking on a human nature, God taking on flesh we want to we, so these are the questions we get we just want to ask them back to the muslims um i see rapid fire going through a bunch of slides here so no i'm just going to the main slides we were um oh, okay. so i was just going to talk about um what is it um on the allah sorry it's just messed up 200 it was 216 this was yeah um it, like if you think practically slave of allah is walking to allah allah says like i will run as you walk to me allah is only like by the way doesn't he have two right Two right feet or something, two right shins. Uh, yeah, yeah. So oh. two right arms. So yeah. it like it's difficult to balance. I know uh, oh, someone so he's just who wears. One shin. I know, one shin. and I expressed from so two right hand, two right hands, one shin, and I know we know like what Allah's green dress, all those kind of things. Uh, so you know, like if someone is wearing dress, it is difficult to run with dress, even though in UK police is not able to find people when they are running with their dress. But so Allah wouldn't be that fast anyway. But here's the, another story where Allah uh, steps into the Allah in this occasion, like kind of we know what Allah looks like, bigger, smaller, stronger, shinless version of um, us, a little bit physically disabled. Probably Allah knows what it looks like to be disabled. Mm. Yeah. My question is, may, what if? Um, Allah's slave walks to him when he's in the last third of the night. Does then he leave the lowest heaven and to go run to him? Sister, what's wrong with you? You don't think Allah has a good planning skills? <laughs> because Allah will plan. Allah will say, slave, wait there. I'll, wait there I'll arrange that time. Um, um, okay, so in here, Muhammad says, I saw my Lord with curly hair, a young man with a mustache not no beard wearing green cloth mm -hmm. clothing 
So Allah runs, Allah has forms and shapes, and then now it's like people are seeing what Allah looks like. He's got curly hair. Mm -hmm. Naturally curly. Naturally curly, yeah. And then he doesn't have beard, he's got mustache. Does he shave? And he likes green. And he's a young man. Yeah. He works out. He runs. Mm. What do you think about this, Brother Joy? He's speechless. Um, First time. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm just... I, I guess the answer is part of my question. So he, he does wear green clothing. So that's part partially an answer. I was curious what he wears. Um, when he yeah. runs, you mean? Yeah, when he's running. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, By the way, I mean, I think I think we made the point just abundantly clear. Now, any Muslim who objects, to, and by the way, like we've only we got like what four hundred sixty three more to go or something like that. Like we, we have so many examples <laughs> of this. <laughs> so so I mean, any Muslim who, any Muslim who challenges. So if you're a Christian and you witness to Muslims, and you're you're kind of like hit by this objection to to the to the Muslim, first you should have a good defense from your from the bible and your faith you should know your faith but then when you answer from the when you answer from the bible when you answer from our perspective you can now go with this information and ask them the very same questions they ask you yeah. when they talk to you about incarnation or god appearing god becoming visible go to them with these sources and you'll see how they really don't have answers to these questions like i mean Oh, it's really laughable some of some of the responses to this stuff. I, I've I've seen it, and they really don't have good responses at all. Yeah, even if you think like um, it, like while Islam kind of teaches Allah is capable to step into the world, and He does. Allah steps into His creation. Then you ask the, why He does that. What is His purpose? Because we get to ask the same question to a Christian scripture and then we see what is the purpose of Yahweh as he enters and engages with his people. Even that kind of brings big differences between Allah and Yahweh. So God step, God of Christian scripture steps into the world so because he wants to dwell with his people. Allah steps into the world for beauty context or something. I don't know. Like, <laughs> Maybe to run towards the... the... Yeah, maybe like Allah sitting on the throne probably makes Allah feel fat or so. I don't know. Like, I don't want anyone to accuse me with hate speech at this stage. But if Allah is sitting on that throne and then angels are cutting and now Allah is bigger than his throne, probably Allah says, I figured out better life is to do exercise. I'm going to start running from now on. Oh, on that note, sister, um, do you have this slide where there, there's a commentary that mentions, you know how... Um, how many angels are, are carrying the throne of Allah? Yeah, and that that number increases. Yeah, okay. Let me find that one. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I think like, he needs to start running more. I mean, if, if it's not his his running plan is not working for him, yeah, because let me, let the me angels see. are increasing. So does that mean the weight's increasing? Is that what that means, or what does it mean? Hmm. The angels Maybe should carry his throne. Yeah, he's been eating from Jannah, and his uh, weight is increasing, so he needs more. Ah, so he needs to do more running there, right? I guess that's that's the solution. I don't know. I don't think running helps. Like, it's running not... makes you tired. Like, imagine daughter of Christ, three oh. miles, one hour, 40 minutes. Okay. Guys, it was six miles, three miles to get there, three miles back. Yeah, that means like she, she did like walking. She spent three hours just walking today. And it was a lot of his uphill, okay? Don't hit. What? Uphill. I mean, you got more exercise. I think you got more exercise than I oh. did. So. Yeah. You did better than Allah, sister. Thank you. Be proud of yourself. Thank you. I am proud of myself. Uh, by the yeah. way, um, the reason why Allah doesn't have a beard, the young man in that hadith, is because he was young, too young to have grown a beard yet. It says in the commentaries. Just letting you know. Yeah, we uh, did. We did uh, looked at that like in the past, yeah. um, which specifies the age of Allah as well. You go and you get into all kinds of theological problems, and the fact that he sort of ages like a human. Yeah, so wait, he has a mustache but no beard? Yeah, mustache. What... Yeah, it's, he uh, has mustache with no beard. You know, like young men when they're just entering. Oh, puberty. he's like just developing. Ah, oh, okay, okay. So he's just a. Oh. Allah is just like, wow. So he was in like his. Uh, like, okay. Teens? <laughs> teens? Yeah. yeah. Was his voice cracking? 
It doesn't say. It just says uh, a young man uh, uh, just entered puberty. That's Allah. That's how Muhammad saw him, guys. So, so I just want the Muslims to see. You guys, you Muslims, you see how when you attack the Bible and you attack the doctrines of incarnation and theophanies and God appearing and all, when you attack that, you don't realize that you're actually attacking your false God, your false, your false Allah, the Allah of Islam. You're attacking this false deity. Okay, here we have it here. Well, you I'm really not sure if it is. This, I am not uh, sure if it is this one, brother. Oh, okay. Uh, no, you can do Oh, yeah, I can do that as well. Um, but you notice what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, um, I know. Yeah, it's like yeah. 467 slides, brother. Um, yeah, um, yeah, but sorry. Daddy, you know the one I'm talking about? The one where it talks about like he is like six angels and it goes to like eight angels or something like that. Like the angel, the number of angels increase. Uh, I, I remember this. Uh, anyway, I remember hearing about it and I read it, uh, the, the commentary. So it's definitely there. I just don't. I just don't have it offhand. Maybe someone in the chat knows which one we're talking about. But um, yeah. So. Um, we are searching for it, brother. I just thought it would be easier out of look at out of four hundred. Um, no, it's because it's too far from. I'm, I'm like younger than I am older than Allah, but I've got like bad earrings as well as bad um eyes. Okay, um, so just, um, oh, here, I got it here. Okay. Um, it's in Arabic, though. Let me give it to daughter. Um, um, hold on. I'm going to send it to you on Skype. Um, I don't have the reference in front of me. I just have the Arabic text. Uh, okay. I'll just make it. Um, just but I'm sure, I'm sure Hatun has, has it translated somewhere on this one of the slides. You never know. Maybe I I remember the hadith. I just need to find where it is. Um, it's not on sunnah dot com. No, it's 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 in. I think it's in one of the commentaries. It's in one of the one of the tafsir. Uh, I just um I can search the Arab. I have the Arabic. Why, why don't you just but, translate it for us, sister? Kind of overall, and uh, then it says the prophet says, the carriers of the throne today are four. Uh, and when the day of judgment, the day of resurrection comes, uh, Allah will support them with four more, so they will be eight. So right now there's four, like four carriers, four angels carrying it. But at, the, at that day, there's going to be eight. So is he getting like bigger? Is he getting weight or something? Or what's going on? Why are there more angels? They need support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they need more support. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess we did kind of overall made our point. Oh, yes, Tafsir uh, Surah 69, verse 17. Surah 69, verse uh, 17. Mm -hmm. And I, post, I posted the, the text in, in the chat as well for those who speak Arabic. Oh, bless you, Thank brother. you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So let's look at it. That's a new one to me, sister. I do have that in my slides. I just need to find it. You know, um, yeah, the, um, yeah. So, so it's in one of the commentaries. Yeah, um, did you see which commentary? Oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it is in there. Sixty-nine, uh, Surah sixty-nine, verse seventeen, guys. If you go to all the tafsirs, it's on the screen. Oh, oh sorry. wow, they have it in She's English too. It. It. They have it in English. Look at that. Yeah, wow. they do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Maybe jogging is not a good idea. We don't encourage people to jog because it's, it might be not useful. But okay, he's, it is. Angels will be over the borders, the age of the heaven. And then on that, on that day, eight angels are going to deal with Allah and his throne. <laughs> Do you want to read it for us, sister? And it's fullness, please. Yeah, I butchered it, but it doesn't matter. It's yeah, the word uh, of Allah. And the angels will be over its borders, the edges of the heaven and above them. The angels that have been mentioned on that day, eight angels or eight files of them will carry the throne of the Lord. Okay, so what we have is so far... Not only Allah has weight problem, all those kind of things, and he's not fit, but Allah does enter his creation. 
um, so dear Muslims, while uh, Christian scripture tells us um, God enters his creation for fellowship with his people, um, to engage with his people, so what does Allah do? What is the purpose of Allah as Allah enters his creation? And as Brother Jai brought up a couple of questions, so who is in charge of universe when Allah enters his creation? Because Allah is alone, lonely, and needy. Therefore, there is a problem if Allah is into his creation, who is running the universe. And of course, Jai is curious about um, Allah's dress code as Allah runs to the slave who is walking to Allah. Uh, by the way, for that hadith, word for word, from the 4 to the 8, that's Qurtubi, um, Surah 69, verse 17. It's in the Arabic there, sister. Okay. Just for people who want to know. Okay, we will translate that and put it up on one of pla one place. Um, okay, um, anything else anyone wants to add at this stage? And then I need to get our attention to chat to see what's happening in the chat, by the way. There it is. Um... Anyone wants to add anything? Sister Kay? Um, I was just uh, reading some commentary. They're trying to dismiss this verse and say it's inconceivable that Allah will be held up by his own creation. Who, who, who cares what people are dismissing? Um, <laughs> well, if that's your position, then you shouldn't be a Muslim. Yes. You, you see what I was saying? How they'll deny what their book says just to commit themselves to creeds and doctrines and you know, that's it. Like, they're more committed to the creeds than they are to the actual book itself. Um, yeah, someone asked me about this word, istawa. Yeah, yeah someone is asking, what is the um, word istawa oh. mean in the uh, in Yeah, um, this is a big debate for Muslims. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> it, it's, it's the verse, Ar-Rahman al al-Arsh istawa. Ar-Rahman on the throne has spread, basically. It's the word-for-word -word, um, literal translation of that verse. Mm -hmm. uh, Muslims are having a field day, uh, disagreeing with each other. What does spread mean? Uh, what we believe, sister, as Muslims for that verse is, you believe that he spread, but you don't ask how. You, be you believe in the, in the nature of the spreading, but not the how of the spreading. Because <laughs> otherwise, you go into all kinds of kufr, thinking that Allah is physical. Uh, what do you say, Brother Jai? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a big problem verse for Muslims. The, um, if you try to read the commentaries, like how they understand it. Yeah. Um, some Muslim schools say it means this. Some say it means that. But at the end of the day, it points to their God having some sort of physical location, like above his throne somewhere. I mean, unless it's in that part of the night. <laughs> um... or, or unless he's jogging or something like that, of course. So, um... Uh, it, I just noticed time is 22.38 in UK, and um, that means my guest is supposed to be silent from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning, and they are making noise right now. So that means uh, let's kind of plan to finish the live stream soon. Um, anyone wants to add anything before I ask you your conclusion remarks? Surah 20, verse 5, sorry, that's the spreading verse, that's all. Okay, anyone wants to add anything before I give you time to make your conclusion remarks? And silent means no. Okay, uh, beloved of Christ, Brother Jai, would you like to summarize for us um, some yeah. great news Lord Jesus Christ offered to humanity as well as some of the bad news Bad, Muslims have bad questions, problematic questions, problematic passages Muslims have um, they have to deal with it. Ideally, if you start from Islam, then you will finish with our glorious gospel. So, wherever you want to start. All right. I'll just recap from the beginning. So, as we saw, the testimony of the Bible through and through, clear as day, that God manifests himself, God becomes visible, God appears, he enters into his creation. This is something that we see 
all over the Old Testament. We we brought up a lot of different examples. We could have done, we could have multiplied it by the hundreds, literally. I'm not exaggerating. And this carries on into the New Testament, the incarnation, the ultimate time, the of ultimate importance, the ultimate uh, uh, act of salvation, <clears throat> God coming to save His creation. We see that this this includes incarnation, God taking on human flesh, God taking on assuming a human nature. Fully God, fully man. And he entered into he entered into the body of Mary, the womb of Mary, and uh, and he you know this is the day this is Christmas this is what we celebrate the birth the birth of our Savior the birth of our God um, <clears throat> in the words of Elizabeth um, you know this the, the, she, he, she, she called she called Mary the mother of her Lord why because Jesus is God he is the Lord of the universe <clears throat> so this is understood and this is this is the Christmas story God becoming incarnate God taking on human flesh for the purpose of the gospel the glorious news which he died on the cross took our place taking our punishment on himself the the punishment that was rightly due to us he took on himself he defeated death he conquered the enemy conquered the devil and he rose from the dead the evidence that he conquered death is that he rose from the dead. The evidence that sin was paid for was that he rose from the dead. <clears throat> and there's so much going on at the cross. We can we can do multiple streams on the atonement as well. But yes, this is what we saw, that this concept of God entering into creation, this concept of God becoming visible. And then we also saw in Islam, to Muslims who want to object to the incarnation, or they want to object to theophanies or god becoming visible god appearing muslims who want to object to that do so at the risk of blaspheming their own false book <clears throat> so so they're, they're blaspheming but they're doing so at the cost of blaspheming their own book at the same time and yeah uh much more to say, but just my brief summary. I just want to thank Sister Hatoon, Sister Daughter of Christ, Sister K, and all of the viewers. Um, all of the viewers, I just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, and I pray that everybody um, has a blessed, a blessed Christmas, a blessed time. Even Sister Hatoon, even Daughter of Christ, even Sister K. <laughs> We wish them a Merry Christmas and I pray that they have a joyous time this year. Maybe this year we're different. <laughs> okay, so yeah, thank you for having me on, sister, uh, sisters. Thank you for letting me be your guest and thank you for letting me be on. Um, I love doing streams with you guys and uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much. God bless and uh, take care, everybody. Uh, beloved of Christ, thank you very much for joining us tonight and helping us to think through um, incarnation and also application of that in many different forms in Islam. Um, Sister K, yes. what are your conclusion remarks? Um, my conclusion is always to go to scripture and I'm in um, Philippians 2 and, um, and 6. And this is who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God He's talking about Jesus, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And uh, wherefore God also hath exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, God the Father. Um, 
it's hard to, to fathom when you've been told that God can't do certain things, but God can do anything he wants. And our God is a redeemer. That's what you see throughout scripture. And he came to save us from the true enemy of our soul. Um, and so it's, it's beautiful that our God is personal, personal and, um, and Allah, you, you don't have that. Like you said, he just comes, he shows up, and he disappears. He doesn't have any reason for showing up. He just runs, jogs, listens to prayers, and then disappears. Um, the guy that we have, he, he humbled himself, even to the death of the cross, for our salvation, for eternal life. So um, that's my final word. Stop playing around with the um, false god, Allah, and... Bow your knees to the true living God. Um, Beloved? I was really happy that we opened the Bible today, sister, and we went through what our God is really like, how he appeared to people personally, had personal interactions with them. And I'm really glad that I'm serving this God who was not shamed to come down to the work, the work of his hands, us, to save us. Not ashamed to do that. And he went further than that. He allowed sinful men to kill him so that he can save me. That's the God that I worship. He's not a God who's confused like Allah. Uh, sometimes he appears, but then he can't appear, but then he's, he has to be behind a veil. Uh, my God came to interact with human beings without a veil. And that's the God that we worship. And uh, please, brothers and sisters, focus your eyes on him during Christmas, don't be uh, distracted by anything else. He is the one that you, you uh, th th he is the reason why we're celebrating. And to keep proclaiming him to uh, people who believe in other false gods who do not have the privilege that we have. That's all I say, sister. Thank you very much. Um, so overall, what we have is we've got glorious gospel because our God is glorious we've got beautiful gospel because it is the gospel of beautiful god so therefore uh therefore um uh, therefore what i can say is while we are celebrating incarnation fest we need to enjoy lord jesus christ the king of universe steps into this broken world, becomes a baby. Why? Because he wants to dwell with his people. When, when we identify our gospel as glorious gospel, our God as glorious God, we mean it. It changes the hearts and lives of individuals. It transforms the society. Therefore, one day, every knee will bow down to him. Willingly or unwillingly, that will happen. Incarnation fest starts with Genesis 1, 2, 3, where we see God sees the problem and then gives the solution. Throughout scripture, everyone is pointing the Messiah who is going to step into the world. Messiah comes first birthday for the king of universe takes place approximately 2000 years ago and king of universe turns up in this broken world as a poor vulnerable baby being looked after by poor couple yet he is willing to turn up on the cross out of zero obligation to give himself for me why because he wants to dwell with me he wants me to delight in him because he's delighted in me as doesn't matter how we celebrate how, what we do on day of um, incarnation fest um, on Christmas day doesn't matter I do hope that we will have extra place in our, heart, our hearts so that we make a room for the king of universe I do hope that as a Christians Every day is incarnation fest for us. Every day is Christmas for us because our God is beautiful, delightful, and gorgeous every day. So, uh, Brother Jai, uh, daughter of Christ, and Sister Kay, thank you very much for joining us 
um tonight by god's grace we will see you tomorrow evening on different topic if things doesn't work we will see you on different platform god bless you all and have a lovely christmas as i said let's focus our hearts our minds and all of our beings to the one who turned up into this world as a baby god bless you all